So it's quite a chilly morning in Warsaw. Um, some people are here on site. Most of them will talk to you soon and you will be able to see them as well. Uh, my name is Natalia Czfik. I am executive director of Wikimedia Polska. And today uh, Wikimedia Polska is hosting uh, this event, which is a hybrid event. However, most, most of you are watching us online. And uh, just a quick look at the agenda before we begin. Um, so our, our Heritage Guard Network final event um, is going to take place um, until 5 uh, p.m. Uh, first, we will briefly introduce the project and ourselves. Then you will hear our uh, keynote speakers, Paki Kumar and Ludmila Slominska. Um, and then we will have uh, some time to, to summarize uh, this part and uh, perhaps you will have some questions. I hope you will have questions uh, because this is a unique opportunity to, to ask our experts um, whatever is interesting for you. Uh, then we will have a 15 minutes coffee break and then you will see the main part of the event, meaning every working group within the project will present their uh, key conclusions, their key findings. Uh, then uh, we will have lunch. I mean, in the middle of, of the presentation, we will have a lunch break. Then we will have um, a coffee break at 15. And uh, the last part of the event is a discussion panel uh, with um, more guests, uh, Julia Maria Koszewska, Christian Humboldt, David Hermanson. Uh, and in the end, we will wrap up and uh, talk about final conclusions. Uh, but first, um, let me just say that you are welcomed today. I see that many of you are still joining the event. Uh, I will now present um, another file. Uh, because I want to introduce you to the project. I know that some people that are here uh, already know it because you've been following uh, the Heritage Guard Network Seed Project or you joined our working group or you have seen our presentations, but some of you probably um, also uh, need to have, um, need to be introduced to, to the context. Uh, so I will give you all necessary information, basic information about the project. Okay. Um, so Heritage Guard Network is just a brief title um, for a seed project that is funded by the Swedish Institute. And the project uh, lasted several months um, and the aim was to uh, understand how can we empower uh, communities, especially through digital crowdsourcing, uh, to protect uh, endangered cultural and natural heritage. Uh, and the main context of this project is Wikimedia platform, Wikimedia projects like Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, Wikidata, and throughout the event we will mention uh, all of them. Uh, and it was initiated by uh, our Swedish partner, Wikimedia Sweden, uh, who uh, is a leader of this project. And then uh, other uh, Wikimedia affiliates joined. I will introduce them a bit later. Uh, so we had several aims of, of the project. And I want to underline that this is a seed project, meaning uh, its scope and resources are limited. And basically we had this time to zoom in and zoom out of our Wikimedia world and to understand better how can we engage um, more and more volunteers and partners into uh, safeguarding heritage, uh, either by using Wikimedia platforms or engaging them in many other ways. However, it is always Wikimedia um, that is the final context. Um, but to, to tell you a little bit more about project aims, 
um, in more detail. We wanted to compile knowledge and develop best practices for how to use media platforms to, to digitally preserve um, natural and cultural heritage. Uh, this is something that is already happening with, within Wikimedia since years, but we want to, to understand better how can we uh, expand uh, our, um, our network. Um, and we also wanted to, to see how many partnerships outside Wikimedia um, can we have, um, who can join forces with us uh, to better safeguard heritage using Wikimedia platforms. Um, and of, of course, an important part of our uh, research was to, to understand better what are the obstacles uh, for newcomers uh, when it comes to joining Wikimedia in that particular context. Um, so our findings, I believe, are valuable for the whole movement, not just for the heritage context. Um, we wanted to understand better uh, what case studies can be uh, a benchmark or an, an inspiration for us, um, who are the best uh, people to work with in the long term. And uh, the seed project is to define whether we want to uh, have a bigger project in future. And that will require asking for further funding from the Swedish Institute. And that larger project could be a three-year project where we ex actually build the Heritage Guard Network, we expand it based on the recommendations that um, I hope together we will uh, discuss today. Because today we will present you uh, main findings from the working groups, but we will ask all of you, the experts that are present here, uh, all of you on Zoom to participate uh, and uh, to elaborate on those recommendations with us. Um, a little bit more maybe uh, about the, the Swedish Institute itself. Uh, it's an important government in Sweden uh, and it's aimed to, it aims to strengthen, strengthen international relations and development. Um, that is why that was the institutions that we turned to in order to finance this uh, particular project. Um, and here you can see logos of uh, the main of main partners Wikimedia Sweden, Wikimedia Poland, Wikimedia Georgia and Wikimedia Ukraine uh, because the project is primarily focused on uh, our region, mainly uh, the CEE region. However, as you will see uh, in our presentations during the project we were joined by volunteers from all over the world because it turned out that this topic is so valuable um, and so relatable uh, from people from other regions that uh, in the end, uh, we'll present you also input from uh, outside of CE, um, as it turned out to be super um, helpful for um, the aim of our project. Uh, and the project was also supported by Content Partnerships Hub and the CE Hub, both uh, existing within the Wikimedia movement. Uh, and the timeline of our project um, is, is, is visible here. We started in December. Uh, however, we worked on our grant application for several months before that. Uh, and it was the great leadership from Wikimedia Sweden um, that enabled us to cooperate and, and work on, uh, on the ideas uh, in a structured and systemic way. Um, in, uh, in February, we had a kickoff meeting in, uh, in Sweden, and being there, we also had a unique opportunity to, to uh, look closely into the archives of the Swedish uh, of archives uh, institution. Um, next, we have established four working groups, and then uh, we had another project meeting. Uh, in the meantime, the working groups were already um, working, and um, we met for a short while in uh, Poland during Wikima Wikimania. And today uh, is the final closing event where finally we can show you 
uh, the outcomes of our work so far. Um, also, just to make sure that we are at the same page, um, when we talk about heritage, we refer to the legacy from the past. Um, and something that we pass to, to, to future generations, uh, we decided to focus both on cultural and natural heritage, especially the one that is endangered. Um, and um, with this in mind, we were inviting experts from both of these um, themes. Some examples of cultural and natural heritage, maybe <coughs> some of you recognize uh, these buildings or animals or uh, nature sites and a more graphical representation. Something more obvious and less obvious. Um, but why Wikimedia and heritage? Why did we do why did we decide to uh, to go with this topic um, here where we come from? Uh, well, each of the project partners has a long history of collaboration with uh, the so-called GLAM institutions, uh, museums, galleries, libraries, and archives. Uh, each of us um, implemented many educational um, projects uh, related to, for example, um, promoting our Wikimedia platforms as a uh, places on the internet where you can um, store data about um, natural and cultural, cultural heritage. Uh, and that is why we thought uh, we can make use of our knowledge and experience so far, and perhaps by creating the network, uh, expand it um, further. Um, of course, we could, uh, we could um, think of many more arguments why Wikimedia. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a global community uh, that is widespread all over the world. And um, we are uh, considered one of the last places on the internet that is free of promotion. Um, we do not collect data about our users. Uh, we do not use um, algorithms to personalize um, our content. So we have a vast technological infrastructure that we can work with that is important part of um, our heritage as well. And having this outreach, we believe that we also have a responsibility to join forces with those who care about the heritage. Um, so this is, this is the introduction that I wanted to give you. You will be able to meet uh, particular project partners uh, during our presentations, because um, each presentation will be um, led by um, working group leaders. And now uh, I think mm, we have a little bit more time for uh, keynote speakers and uh, we could soon begin the presentations. Uh, just want to ask if the project partners want to add anything from their side. Maybe you want to welcome our guests as well. If anyone wants to speak right now, we will be heard. I think you covered everything very well, uh, Natalia. Eric from Wikimedia Sweden speaking. I'm not sure if you can see. If, I don't think there's any camera to see us. <clears throat> online. Um, it's obviously thanks to the Swedish Institute that we have been able to uh, carry out this seed project uh, so far. And I think that one important kind of one, one important focus of the day as well is to figure out what additional projects that we could, you know, how can you use the insights from this project to identify further opportunities and also explore ways of you know, apply for funding for these further opportunities because I mean the, the aim is to turn this into also, um, uh, or we hope that it can be turned into a long-term sustainable work because we see, you know, that there's a lot of opportunities and, and needs, uh, but there are still a lot of things to, to do. Do you want to add anything, Olesia? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, maybe before we start, I just want to uh, add that um, 
this is now an academic project. We are not researchers, we are not academics, uh, the project partners. Um, and the final papers that you will see and that will be presented to you fully after the event um, are more for a broader audience. However, we did cooperate with researchers and some of them will uh, give their presentations uh, right now. Uh, but the project is generally um, aimed for the widest audience possible. Paki, would you like to start with your presentation? Okay. Thank you very much. And sorry about the, the technical errors. Uh, it's, I think, inevitable every presentation that I give, you know, something or the other <laughs> happens in, in terms of te technology. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to give this keynote speak. Uh, it's fantastic to see the field progressing. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, some of my PhD research that um, I defended my PhD in 2019. And when I was writing my PhD, there was only a few examples of crowdsourcing during disasters that affect cultural heritage. And now it's it's really nice to see the movement growing and you know more and more people uh, getting involved in this. And then you know some more examples of of, uh, of crowdsourcing that we can study and use and um, and then learn from. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, uh, I am Pahi Kumar. I am a lecturer at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage in University College London. I've been there for about uh, three years now. And before that, I was doing my PhD in IMT Luca in Italy. And uh, some of the work that I am presenting today is uh, my PhD work that I did in IMT, but also a lot of it has been continuous work for me. So over the years, I've been, you know, working on it. And now, right now, I'm working on a book on uh, crowdsourcing during disasters that affect heritage. So uh, it's very nice to be in this meeting because some of this, I can use it as an inspiration in my book as well. So thank you very much. Um, Great, thanks. So um, just to give you an overview of the presentation today, what I did was I I used the three areas that you know the project has been working on already to structure this talk. Uh, and I make three three main arguments in this talk. Uh, one is risks. So during disasters, all heritage sites are not equally vulnerable or at risk. And this is so we'll see this through an example that, um, that I'll be talking about, about the 1966 Florence flood. Then there are uh, lessons for engagement from the past that we can help, you know, from the past experiences, we can help understand the engagement strategies that can help motivate the crowd during disasters. And lastly, uh, technology, my work is not related to Wikimedia so far, but I will be showing you some uh, some of the uh, work in technology that I've done with user-generated data on social media and artificial intelligence that can help us assess damage on ground uh, during disasters. So let's begin with risks and engagement. I want to uh, show you an example from the 1966 Florence flood. And I know that you know this is a time before the internet. And this is one of the arguments that, you know, uh, in every peer reviewed journal that I have written for, I have to defend myself. Why, why do you call this crowdsourcing before the internet? Because now that, you know, with internet crowdsourcing, well, internet is, uh, is the go to medium for us, you know, uh, and we cannot imagine crowdsourcing without the internet now. But crowdsourcing did exist before the internet. And uh, what I've done is to understand crowdsourcing. Of, um, uh, I've tried to delineate crowdsourcing using the eight elements of crowdsourcing. And what I've found is the only difference between crowdsourcing in the past and crowdsourcing today is the medium that we are using. So in the past, they've used newspapers, they've used uh, telegrams, they've used letters. Uh, 
and now we use the the application that's available to us on uh, in the uh, in the world wide web but apart from that the overall aims of crowdsourcing still remains the same which is to uh, to use the the intelligence that is available in the crowds to understand what has happened on the site to get more information to help rescue heritage and so on so let's begin looking at the example of florence this is uh, florence in 1966 uh, I'm not sure if you know about this event, but this event is considered to be a catalyst of, for heritage conservation. A lot of new techniques were developed in heritage conservation after the floods. And Florence had become a center for international cooperation. So people from all over the world came to Florence uh, to, to restore heritage, to rescue heritage, and so on. When I said, you know, not all parties are equally vulnerable, what we understand from Florence is that the proximity to river in this case was extremely important to understand, you know, which were the ones which were more at risk. So for instance, Uffizi, which is right here, you can see, you know, um, I don't know. I'm still trying to understand, you know, how to manage myself in a hybrid event, uh, but uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. No, I don't think so. But uh, if you're familiar with if, uh, if you're familiar with Florence, you would know that a lot of uh, you know cultural institutions, important cultural institutions, are on the banks of River Arno, uh, which includes uh, Uffizi, which includes the Science Museum. It also includes the uh, Bibliotheca, uh, and so on. So all these organizations were more at risk, and the the kind of you know. Um, the kind of policies they had in terms of storage, where they were keeping their inventories, where they were keeping their important materials, were also uh, an important lesson for us because, you know, these things did impact the the amount of damage that they suffered. So, if the important collections were in the basement, they suffered uh, a lot of damage. If the important collections were, let's say, up, up on the higher floor, then they were saved. And it's also I think the, the 1966 floods is also a very interesting story in terms of the connection we understand with heritage. Um, so I've read stories, and these stories are available in the National Archives of London, in the British Library, as sound archives, uh, in many archives in uh, around Italy. And I've gone in to, to different archives and tried to understand, you know, how people responded to uh, to this disaster. And one of the very interesting things was that people risked their own lives to save heritage, which is, you know, which is a rare uh, evidence that we have uh, in this case. So um, heritage managers have recollected, you know, running on bridge that was shaking to get to the location to save heritage. Then uh, Maria Bonelli, who is the director of the Science Museum, recollects that uh, the water came up to her neck level when she was trying to move uh, heritage objects to a safer location. And she also recollects that, you know, it was impossible for her to move because she was all alone by herself. And, and it was impossible for her to move um, collections that were big, so she had to prioritize, you know, what she could save and what she could not save. So this is this is a very interesting story of, you know, how people risk their own lives to save heritage. Um, as soon as the news of Florence floods went to the to the world, people from all over the world came to Florence and uh, worked in Florence to save heritage. Now, this is, again, one of the examples that teaches us a, a little bit more about crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing in today's world, we, we know that, you know, the crowdsourcers are the one who initiates the project and then we gather the crowd around it. But this in this project, as well, in this initiative, the crowd did not wait for a call. They, they went to Florence straight away. So it was a crowd-initiated movement. Uh, in, in this case. So a um, few days after the, um, the floods uh, started, um, 
sorry, the floods happened. Committees were formed in Italy, UK, USA, Netherlands, Mexico, and Australia. These are the, the committees that I could find. And I'm sure that there are more committees around the world that, that we do not know of. And these committees were uh, of were diverse groups of historians, curators, politicians, bankers, philanthropists, and so on. They had three goals. One was to rescue heritage, the other one was to restore heritage, and the third one was to raise funds to restore heritage. The American Committee had a goal of raising $2.5 million, which is roughly equivalent to $20 million in today's uh, uh, in today's world, and they were successful in raising this money, which is again one of the uh, brilliant examples of you know crowdfunding, which is a part of crowdsourcing. Uh, and uh, the UK-based committee raised about uh, two hundred and twenty thousand, two hundred thousand, more than two hundred thousand pounds. And we do not know about you know how much the Italian committee but uh, raised, but they also raised a huge amount of money to save heritage. Um, so how did they do it? Uh, they sent a call to participate, uh, which was in letters, which was in newspapers, in telegrams, and all possible mediums that they could use. And this is one of the one of the draft letters that I found in the uh, in the archives in Lucca. Uh, it says the flo the floods in Florence has caused more damage to her heritage that was done during the war. So in this, they are they are trying to evoke a memory. They this was. Um, right after the um, the World War II in which Florence had also uh, uh, suffered damage. And what they wanted to do is evoke a memory to, to tell everyone that during wars, Florence had not suffered as much damage as during the floods. And then they, they talk about how limited uh, resources the government and the parliament has. And then they they also talk about you know what they need. They need billions and billions of of lira, uh, hundreds and billions of lira. And then they they also mention why is Florence important? That Florence has represented the universal spirit of civilization, culture, and art in the Western world. And then they go on and say they, that they need everybody. It's a very, you know, a very strong statement that they need everybody. And then they send an urgent plea to um, for contribution. And then this contribution was was meant to be a call to uh, to give money, but it resulted into a lot of other things such as materials and knowledge. I will see it a, a little bit later. And this is well. This is one example of how you know they had uh, sent the call to participate, but uh, the UK-based committee had a different approach towards the call, and the US-based committee had a different approach to, to send the call. And uh, I will summarize all of this in my book, which I hope to publish somewhere soon, uh, sometime soon. But uh, for now, this is I think gives a good idea of you know how we can motivate people. Uh, so what happened after the floods? It's uh, we. This is the um, the data analysis from about 700 records that is uh, in the Ragyanti Foundation in Luca, and uh, I I found out that you know there were more than 25 countries that contributions were sent from. Most contributions were sent from Italy and the US, and it came from uh, many different uh, you know kinds of people, such as individuals. The institute, uh, some institutes also sent uh, contributions, universities, uh, museums, galleries, and so on. One of the interesting findings, which I think is is very relevant for us in today's uh, in today's context, is that the interest of uh, interest in a disaster uh, declines with time. So you can see in this graph that you know. Um, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen, that the interest in the uh, in the event uh, was very much high, at a high point during the first few days of this disaster, and then it slowly declined, and then people move on to the other disaster, which is something that you know other researchers have also found. So if we want to create an impact, it needs to happen very early on during disaster when the disaster is fresh in people's memory. Um, 
just to uh, just to show you, you know what uh, what contributions were received people sent money they uh, they came and worked as volunteers they sent knowledge uh, just to remind you that you know this is a very early stages of heritage conservation and this event was a catalyst for for heritage conservation um, and so on um, this is again a very interesting example of how people uh, relate to heritage the two letters that I'm showing on the screen is set, was sent from uh, children who were eight to nine years old and who had never been to Florence. Uh, they they got motivated to send contribution. They, they did a cake and cookie sale in their school, uh, raised about $40 and sent it to, uh, to Florence to save heritage of Florence. And they were able to do this because their teacher had been to Florence a year before, and they, he talked about, uh, you know, how uh, how important was Florence and his experience of being in the Florence. So, you know, people who have been to Florence were kind of influencers, if we can use that term uh, in today's context. You know, the kind of influencers in motivating others who had not been there, who had not experienced Florence and, and its heritage, and motivate them to um, to participate. I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, it's it's a lot of uh, lot of work. I will try to be super quick. Uh, now the next part is technology. You know, so now the, the times have changed. We uh, we live in a world where where we are used to of having our information instant instantaneously on our phones. And how does it change the dynamics of disaster? To understand this, what I've done is I. Um, I wanted to understand how people respond on social media during disasters, and I wanted to understand how can we use social media data to evaluate the situation uh, on the ground. And I've used more than 200,000 tweets and uh, more than 6,000 images on Twitter to understand this. And I've also worked with computer scientists to develop a tool that we could use to assess damage on site. Um, just to quickly tell you that you know, uh, looking at the um, the tweets, maybe I should tell you this before. This uh, this research was published in 2019, 2020, and since then Twitter has changed a lot. Uh, it if you conduct a similar research today, probably we will not have uh, same results as um, as uh, as before. So we should keep that in mind, you know, how the technology also changes uh, with time and how we need to uh, understand the, the, uh, the changes and how it can impact our research as well. So um, in, uh, in 2015, people were posting mostly information on Twitter uh, about heritage that was damaged uh, during the disaster. Sorry, I... I don't think I mentioned that I used the Nepal earthquake as a case study in this, and I've used more than 200,000 tweets that were posted about the Nepal earthquake to understand how people use social media during disasters. Um, they post a lot of sentiments. They post some memories as well of being in Nepal or experiencing Nepal. And then they, they try to organize action, quick action on Twitter. And there was some noise as well, which was, you know, the tweets which were not related to heritage, but were kind of, you know, uh, in the in the data set, which is, again, one of the lessons for us that in uh, in today's technology, we do get a lot of noise, uh, which is not not useful data for us. I also wanted to understand what kind of images uh, get posted. So images uh, are uh, you know, situation, then there are images that show messages. So heritage sites are used as a message to uh, to send a message to the uh, to the country. Then people are, were posting memories uh, of past earthquakes that had damaged Nepal uh, Nepal's heritage site. They're posting their memories of being in her uh, being in Nepal. And then the last one was practice of how people use heritage sites after the disaster. And this is one of the fantastic examples of user generated data that, you know, we can understand how people relate to, to heritage. So you can see the first three images uh, in the bottom is people going to the damaged site and praying there. Uh, it shows the connection that people have with their heritage. So for them, the physical uh, um, 
the physical heritage doesn't necessarily be there even if it is destroyed the place is still important for them to go and pray over there and the last uh, image in the practice is uh, a person taking a selfie in in front of a disaster affected heritage site this is also an example of you know how uh, technology is used uh, during disasters then lastly i want to show you uh, a heritage assessment demo i i i'm sorry i do not think we have the time for it but um i will need to go into another uh, uh what do you call it another window and open this one but if you look it up uh, the heritage assessment dam uh, demo this is a tool that we developed with three computer scientists and what it does is it shows you a heritage site uh let me let me think how to explain this one better it's it's not complicated at all uh, you can select images and the the model will show you whether the model thinks it is an image of a heritage site and whether the image is damaged or not and uh, you can choose your own file and the model shows the prediction uh, levels the the closer the uh, the prediction is to one the model is fairly sure that this is heritage or this is heritage which is damaged uh, the, uh, the the lower the score is uh, it means that the model is not very sure that uh, it is damaged or not um, I'm sorry that we do not have the time to go into this, but I'm happy to find the uh, the link and pop it in the Zoom chat. If anybody is interested, you know, they can have a look at it uh, in their own time. And happy to answer any questions about this at, uh, at some later point as well. Um, just to quickly show you, you know, what kind of images the model classified uh, appropriately and what kind of uh, uh, images the model did not get right. Uh, the images, uh, these images are of heritage, so the ones which are classified as heritage or as not heritage. The ones that you see in uh, in green boxes are the ones which were rightly classified, and the ones that you see in uh, red boxes were the ones which were wrongly classified. Um, the model is still, you know, um, I would say it's 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 not perfect at all. Uh, it was one person, which was me annotating these images and, uh, you know, maybe six months of training the model and and retraining it to get some kind of results. It was, it's a good starting point to understand what we can do using uh, uh, artificial intelligence. But there's a, still a lot and lot of work that needs to be done before we can say that, you know, the model is can recognize in various types of heritage. I can tell you for sure that it, uh, if you try it today, it will not recognize any kind of modern heritage. It will most likely not recognize uh, vernacular heritage. It, uh, it's very good in recognizing um, heritage, which is, you know, if you can call it classical kind of heritage, you know, something which is very popular and possibly UNESCO uh, listed as well. But uh, again, you know, it's still, a lot of work needs to be done before we can call this model perfect. Um, just to reiterate the arguments that I made in the beginning, uh, in terms of risks, engagement, and technology, that during disasters, all heritage sites are not equally vulnerable or are at risk. Uh, we can learn a lot of lessons from the past to help us understand engagement strategies, and we can use uh, user-generated data from social media and artificial intelligence to help us understand the damage on site better. With that note, thank you very much for inviting me again. Here's a list of publications that I have on the subject so far. Uh, it will keep growing, I hope. And uh, thank you again. I will stop sharing. The key.
uh, Paquit joined uh, the engagement working group and I must say we couldn't be happier um, to, to have her because it is actually her research uh, that was super inspiring for, for us and it will be reflected in our final paper. Um, any questions for Paquit? I have one question. I'm, I'm not sure if, like, yes. in the... maybe we can uh, move the microphone yeah. to Eric. Okay, yeah, let's do it like this. Um, now I just had one question because I, I think it was interesting, like, the comparison between uh, compares uh, crowdsourcing like, in the non digital and the digital uh, world. Uh, but are there, like, do you see any things that we could kind of learn from the non digital? environment like the time before internet like when we do digital crowdsourcing projects today i think i think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn um some of the lessons are how to motivate the crowd uh some of the lessons are in diversity of uh of crowdsourcers uh i've seen um i did not cover this in the in the presentation but i've seen some crowdsourcing initiatives which was which was done um, in 2015 Nepal earthquake. And this was done by a group of heritage professionals. And uh, the crowdsourcers were only heritage professionals. And whereas in the case of 1966 floods, the crowdsourcers were a diverse group of people, the politicians, they were uh, entrepreneurs, they were philanthropists. So it had a wider reach to the community, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because you know, in, in today's world, we live in, in bubbles, right? Our social media outreach is basically limited to the ones that we follow and usually the the people that we follow and the people follow us are people who are like-minded and people who are you know have similar interests as us but because the uh, crowdsourcers were so diverse the reach to the communities were um, was massive and then I think the, the last one, which I is is using the mainstream media, um, because I think you know they did not have social media at that point, or maybe because they knew the power of of mainstream media. Then they used mainstream media to send messages, and this was done through newspapers. This was done through uh, you know possibly some TV programs as well. And this is again you know. This, this breaks the social media bubbles that we live in and reaches the, um, uh, the crowd. So I think you know these are the three main important lessons I can I can think of for now. Very interesting. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those of you watching. Paki will be with us throughout the whole event, so in case you have more questions, just please put them in the chat. And now I would like to uh, invite Ludmila uh, to give her presentation. Uh, I must uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, my name is Lyudmila Slaminska uh, uh, and uh, I'm uh, from WWF Ukraine uh, working on um, uh, preservation of nature, uh, natural heritage in um, a worldwide organization and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization, what we are doing. Um, and uh, on preservation of natural heritage uh, and uh, what digital initiatives uh, do we have and uh, what digitals, uh, digital initiatives are there in Ukraine and how it can help to preserve and save uh, natural uh, heritage. Um, so uh, our organization is like, worldwide uh, and we are working in Ukraine for 20 years. And since uh, 290, we work as uh, separate uh, organizations. Uh, previously, we used to work in uh, the DWFC umbrella and um, focused on uh, Carpathian Mountains and uh, Danube River, uh, River Delta, uh, because these areas are uh, considered to be the most uh, important for biodiversity in Europe and the most rich uh, of um, biodiversity areas and that's why they were um, priority for conservation and now we work for uh, not only for these areas but uh, in the uh, territory of Ukraine 
and working on uh, nature protection. So uh, the main goal uh, is not only like, have the degradation of uh, planet's natural ecosystem, but also care about uh, people, uh, build a better future for humans and uh, in harmony with environment. Uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, uh, key practices focusing on fresh water, wildlife, uh, forests, climate and energy, and governments and policy. Uh, personally, I work in forest practice, so we'll tell more about it. Um, but our freshwater colleagues have interesting projects on dam removal, uh, on uh, surgeon conservation in the new uh, river delta. Uh, wildlife colleagues they, uh, care about preservation of uh, wolf, lynx, and bear in Ukraine, and uh, have uh, also interesting digital projects on. Um, links uh, telemetry uh, uh, and uh, have, like, results uh, uh, what uh, where the links moves uh, what uh, she eats and uh, other life uh, cycle of this species that helps uh, to have better management plants and preserve the species in uh, wildlife uh, we uh, in forest practice we focus in uh, uh, protection of um, primeval forests, virgin forests, and uh, forests uh, around water bodies. Uh, and here we have like nature uh, conservation uh, projects, and also focused on FSC certification, sustainable forest management, even in exploitation forests. So they also need to be managed in a sustainable way. Uh, main uh, work of our practice is um, to uh, preserve and to create protected areas in uh, primeval forests. It's um, mostly of them concentrated in Capacitan Mountains and in Polisia, it's north of Ukraine. Uh, so about other species are told to surge in um, conservation, dam removal, uh, and uh, also the, the previous year we had the initiative uh, of Kahoka uh, because we have a disaster in Kahoka um, dam uh, uh, due to Russian aggression. So we, it needs a lot of work to cope with consequences of this uh, uh, technical and environmental disaster. Uh, so we have um, communities that uh, suffered from this disaster to have uh, access to fresh water. So uh, sometimes we have to react yes, to, to disasters to, uh, due to nat natural disasters and uh, consequences of the Russian aggression. It also um, influences a lot on our environmental conservation issues. Uh, the main uh, work of forest practices uh, is uh, like I told before, identify, identifying of old growth forests, virgin forests, and um, create protected areas in uh, to, to limit uh, cut, forest cutting, to limit uh, this, uh, human acti activities, economic activities, uh, and um, take it into the strict uh, conservation. So I'll tell you a little bit more about um, digital <coughs> initiatives as, uh, to protect <coughs> the natural environment. Uh, so, um, okay. <coughs> we have um, several uh, platforms in the ecosystem of Kabidabev. It's a map of and natural forests, um, the most precious natural forests, and also high conservation values in uh, FSC certification. Also, we have a platform of forest restoration in Ukraine. <coughs> it's in, uh, now in progress. Uh, so we do it with um, uh, IT uh, organization. Uh, they um, 
told us uh, they want to uh, uh, plant trees and many businesses like it's popular activity to plant trees and um, we help them how to do it uh, in science-based ways how to do it correctly not plant the invasive species not plant the trees in uh, wrong places and do it like in a good way because uh, this initiative of non-professionals to plant trees not always are sustainable so our task is to connect and help them to do it sustainable we also have like Ukrainian forest platform it's a, a good platform for discussion between different stakeholders uh, we have uh, forums uh, uh, of uh, this uh, forest platform on different forest management issues and uh, all the materials is available there <coughs> and also uh, had, uh, interesting projects like oh, let's show you the exhibition uh, to its nature <coughs> it was in uh, it's right in cooperation with um, cultural institute museum of hanchar so it's uh, the main um, aim is to show connection between uh, nature and uh, uh, culture of Ukraine. It's inspired by uh, Ukrainian, famous Ukrainian paintings. And you can see the like, uh, harmony of coexistence. So you can um, click on this uh, site and see uh, explanation of uh, natural issues uh, through uh, their cultural heritage and see uh, the connection and uh, we also had offline exhibition in different locations in Kyiv and now it's available online and has many educational materials for broader audience okay oh, so if you see to show this uh, map map of the most valuable forests uh, we have like physical map and uh, you can uh, see here uh, uh, it uh, it's all grow forests uh, recognized not recognized all grow forests the uh, forests that um, are protected uh, in FSC certification it also continue is continuing to develop uh, to improve uh, new um, layers will be available here so if you click on this link on this map you can find and see the most valuable forests which are already under protection or will be uh, under protection uh, and uh, where is the uh, uh, concentration of biodiversity and what is uh, the most uh, important places to uh, take on the um, conservation in Ukraine. Um, okay. Next uh, is uh, we have also like a Emerald Network Viewer. It's like European wide uh, environmental network for uh, European Union um, it, it co it's called Natura 2000 and in, as Ukraine is not in European Union we have uh, Emerald Network is a uh, site that officially under protection of Bern Convention uh, to uh, its Bern Convention is dedicated to pre preservation of wildlife in uh, Europe and uh, for species and habitats uh, also, we have uh, official site uh, of um, national parks and uh, nature preserves in Ukraine. Uh, and but uh, here we have only uh, like the biggest ones, only uh, uh, nat uh, national parks and reserves. Uh, so you can here find uh, something by by topics uh, and uh, see the restrictions. Uh, because not every uh, so we have uh, like uh, unfortunately it's only in Ukrainian so we have um, 
as natural sites in under occupation. So it's impossible to visit them or uh, uh, some uh, sites are partly uh, restricted to visit uh, also because of war limitations and uh, like 19 sites are available, still available to visit. Uh, so it's um, target audience is mainly uh, tourists, but it's official, it's led by Ministry of Environment. Um, uh, so um, okay, some show you some parks and reserves. Uh, you can like click on every national park that you are interested. See if it's available for visit. Uh, see what activities you can do there, how to get there, and uh, brief information about uh, animals, about wildlife, and uh, see it in the map. So. If it's uh, like still available. So also, we have um, regional initiatives. Unfortunately, uh, so we have uh, more or less available information about big protected areas, but smaller protected areas uh, under managed. Uh, they often uh, under responsibility of local communities, but local communities uh, don't uh, always really care about them. Uh, so we have like strong issues about management about uh, land information about information of their conservation status. Um, uh, some uh, data is uh, available only offline and it's really outdated because it was made in 60 years. It's not precise and to make it more uh, available, it needs uh, time and uh, money. So we have an like, example of the Karpati region of good management in, uh, of uh, locally protected areas so you can see here the map and uh, if you click you can find brief information of this uh, particular site the map the documents uh, uh, who is responsible and uh, what is protected here and uh, what is briefly description of management plan for this protected areas but it's an example in only one region most of the regions don't have this uh, such resources and uh, we have also uh, it's a civil uh, initiative it's not official but we also can see the map um, and find uh, so, uh, uh, protected areas and brief, uh, also have brief statistics here mm, because um, uh, like to yeah so to to, to find uh, uh, we have a limitation on public informations uh, of uh, because of uh, war restriction again uh, we used to have a layer of all protected areas in uh, national cadaster map about land use but uh, now it's uh, restricted and also we have forest management plans uh, and forest maps uh, restricted so many information that what was previously publicly available is now restricted due to war in ukraine uh, for national um, safety uh, purposes and um, also environmental impact assessment uh, is partly restricted uh, and you also people can request uh, uh, sh should officially request the information to get it uh, available but uh, it not, it's not available for, for public access like it was previously uh, so some uh, ideas what we can, can do in further depending uh, in future uh, depending on uh, which budget, uh, how much budget we have, uh, we can create open digital database of protected areas in Wikimedia Commons. For example, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, require big budgets, uh, only uh, some souvenirs for volunteers to, to involve people. We still like, have people, NGOs, who ha have uh, archives, uh, archive workers, uh, who have access to documentation. It's uh, not publicly uh, available for the, for the time uh, all the documents uh, for creation uh, for creation of protected areas so as i sh showed before only like the, one region has has a regional database and for public site but uh, most of these documents 
are not uh, available for this time. Uh, it was uh, previously like initiative of Ministry of Environment to, to create this database, but uh, now due to war it stopped and nobody knows uh, when it will be available. So uh, I think civil society can do it faster. Uh, so this uh, archive materials are officially public, but it requires only time to digitalize it and put it into Wikimedia Commons to make it um, public accessible. And um, activities that requires more uh, budgets and more time is field inventorization in, uh, of protected areas. Because uh, I, uh, I said before, it uh, there uh, out, uh, some materials are outdated, and it's a problem. Maybe a problem to find sources, even to write about these protected uh, areas in uh, Wikipedia, because uh, on the, we have only brief information, and uh, even this information is um, uh, maybe not uh, available. Uh, uh, and this materials uh, of, was of creation is maybe in 60 year, uh, 60s years of uh, last century, and uh, is this um, uh, so I have experience to uh, participation of uh, Wiki Loves Earth, and uh, uh, I find that the information in uh, official resources and uh, try to find this uh, natural mon monument uh, on these materials. And it's it may be uh, <laughs> kilometers uh, in other side <laughs> if you ask local people where is it exactly. So it needs uh, inventorization and just, uh, more precise description of the stage. Is it uh, like preserved uh, for this time or it may, may be degraded uh, already? And we still think it's uh, a protected area. Uh, so it's a lot of work to do. And uh, to start it may be uh, do not for all Ukraine or, or some region because it's very big amount of work, but only for one pilot community, for example. Uh, for example, to find local experts to have precise to, to start from something and then maybe made it bigger. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, our motto is together possible. I hope we'll find the ways to and uh, keep it to keep in touch and do the work uh, for, for the future, do, do more work for the future to keep uh, our heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludmila. I think it was another great presentation and an example of how we can cooperate as Wikimedia with external experts and organizations because we have we share the same goals uh, and ideas. Um, are there any questions for Ludmila? Yes, I see one person, I think. Anyone? You can you can write your questions in the chat. Uh, if there aren't questions uh, at the moment, um, we'll begin a fifteen minute break, uh, which is planned uh, as as stated in the agenda. Uh, fifteen minute coffee break, and we will be back here uh, half past eleven. If you have questions for uh, our two keynote speakers, you can still put them in the chat in the meantime, uh, and we will answer them after the break. Uh, yes. Okay, we thank you very you. much. I uh, can hear you. Yes, great. Oh, I can hear you too. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we are about to begin the next session. Uh, in this session, uh, you will hear um, two presentations from two of out of four uh, working groups. 
Afterwards, we're going to have a lunch break and then we'll be back with another two presentations. And the first to present is Megman Igragimo, uh, who was in charge of the um, legal uh, and copyright working group, and he will present uh, the findings of this group. Hello everyone, as you know, my name is Mehman and I'm representing the Familia countries of Georgia and uh, we work on uh, legal uh, issues, uh, what exists in our uh, world and what limits the Wikimedia's ability to uh, share freely or reuse the freely uh, the materials what exist uh, in different sphere uh, of our life. So as you know, uh, Wikimedia projects like Wikipedia or Wikidata, and we have more uh, projects here, rely on uh, a free license to support open knowledge sharing. Uh, and this policy mandates that content be available uh, for unrestricted, unrestricted access uh, for modification and sharing. Uh, free licensing also uh, attracts uh, partnerships with educational and cultural uh, institutions. Uh, but despite uh, these open access principles, the Wikimedia uh, faces the challenges uh, in different uh, working areas uh, because uh, not all institution or government bodies uh, sharing or often apply uh, restrictive um, license uh, and uh, our like questions uh, what we want to address during our research uh, is this all uh, uh, yeah uh, sorry uh, so I don't want to go uh, point by point you can find all these questions what we want to address in our meta page uh, and I'll start with key issues, uh, what we are facing uh, as a Wikimedia project uh, during our work. Uh, first, this is a restrictive license practices. Uh, like many cultural institutions uh, realize their uh, digital collections under a license that uh, limits for us uh, reuse, uh, modificate or uh, redistribute these works. And uh, while um, uh, these institutions aims to for accessibility uh, to share this for everyone, uh, their licensing practices often conflict with uh, Wikimedia's goal and uh, our mission. Uh, so uh, in this area, we can't reuse uh, or share their collection freely in our Wikimedia projects. Uh, the second is uh, data ownership and control. Government agencies and cultural organizations uh, frequently impose uh, uh, detailed attribution requirements uh, or uh, retain rights to control uh, how this digital representation of, uh, of their collection are used. Uh, that also limits our ability to share this. Uh, and uh, the main two parts is freedom of panorama and copyright. Uh, this is the case what we uh, researched during our uh, research. Uh, freedom of panorama, as you know, uh, is uh, legal rights uh, in some countries allowing individuals to publish images of artworks or buildings uh, without, like located in public areas uh, or spaces, uh, even if copyrighted. Uh, and the issue is that there is no uh, like a uh, single, um, how would say, a framework uh, how the countries uh, uh, like uh, impose the freedom of panorama. Uh, without freedom of panorama, uh, Wikimedia projects uh, ability to host images of, uh, of landmarks or public artworks or monuments is limited. Uh, we can share uh, the image on uh, our repository, which is uh, Wikimedia Commons, and uh, this uh, 
this issue that we can't use uh, to illustrate this image on Wikipedia articles. And uh, just imagine that uh, you are reading the article about some um, like famous uh, building, uh, but without the image. Like local people can understand, like can understand uh, what we are talking and what's the uh, article about. But uh, like foreigner who doesn't have any uh, like ideas uh, about what buildings we are talking, uh, he just can't uh, understand uh, what the niche. Uh, and it's especially uh, critical in regions like we are in Eastern Europe, like Ukraine and Georgia, because um, where many monuments uh, is at risk. Uh, and uh, freedom of panorama allows communities to document and digitally preserve cultural heritage. And without uh, freedom of panorama, uh, that's an issue because we can't uh, save digitally uh, our uh, cultural or natural heritage. Uh, yeah, that's already done. Uh, and I want to go by one by one, uh, the key countries in our projects. Uh, it's Sweden, Ukraine, Georgia, and Poland. And to share with you uh, some cases, how freedom of panorama are in our countries. Uh, starting with Swedish uh, law, well, Swedish law permits commercial use of public uh, art images, but it's uh, restrictive regarding the online da databases. And uh, there was issue between Wikimedia, sorry, like Wikimedia Sweden and with the BAS. Uh, BAS, it stands for the... Um, uh, visual Art Society. Yeah, Visual Art Society. Uh, there are, uh, in 2016, the case between Wikimedia Sweden and uh, the BAS. And uh, somehow Supreme Court of the Sweden limits uh, Wikimedia's right to use uh, databases. The general idea is that uh, you can use the uh, like image, but uh, you can't uh, use as a database in Wikimedia projects. So uh, now there is some like uh, how would say uh, issue that you can you have freedom of panorama and can share the image uh, of art buildings and etc in Wikimedia Commons, but sometimes you need to be more uh, like uh, critical what you are publishing. Uh, about, sorry, it's copyright. Yeah, uh, I guess we skipped one. Uh, Yeah, some issues here, but I'll share uh, like okay uh, in Ukraine and uh, Poland. Well, Poland uh, it's a uh, I would say lucky one between our countries because um, like Poland law offers more uh, permissive uh, freedom of panorama, allowing uh, both non-commercial and commercial use of popular art works in external spaces. So why it's a like important also uh, commercial use because uh, Wikimedia policy says that uh, if it's uh, on our repository, like in Wikimedia Commons, you can use also for commercial purposes all the uh, files what in Wikimedia Commons. And uh, just allowing for non-commercial use uh, freedom of panorama, it's not enough to Wikimedia projects. That's why uh, we need also for the commercial use. And Poland, uh, as I said, is lucky one because uh, they are uh, uh, permit to as for non-commercial, but also for commercial use. Uh, Ukraine also uh, allows, but for non-commercial use, in commercial case, uh, there is limitations. And we can say that uh, currently there is no freedom of panorama in Ukraine. Uh, same. Uh, applies for uh, Georgia. Uh, our uh, law says that uh, you can uh, use for non-commercial uh, like mission uh, without uh, author's permission uh, all the files, but you can't use for the profit. Uh, mainly it says like um, 
public artworks without the author permission, but limits cases where the artwork uh, is the primary subject or used for profit. Uh, we try with our advocacy policy to change this or to uh, end, because then you are say the or it uh, means that if uh, this uh, like object needs to be don't need to be a main object or uh, used for profit, and with and. Uh, adjective, we can uh, change some situation, but currently uh, there is no freedom of panorama in Georgia. And uh, just imagine that 20% of our territory was occupied, and we can publish even the uh, like uh, image of the monuments, what is located in the uh, that areas, and it's under the uh, risk that can be damaged. And the second part of our uh, like uh, research was about the copyright on, of government documents uh, and also all the documents which comes from the uh, state institutions. And we have the free uh, like example example of United States uh, where government documents are in public doc uh, public domain, and you can use all kind of the materials what provided by the governments, uh, starting with the official documents, official text, and also the databases. Uh, we also checked the European Union policy on this. There are PSI directive from us uh, data use, uh, but uh, there is no uh, like single uh, standard for all the member countries. And that's why uh, different countries in uh, which are the uh, EU members, they have different kind of the copyright policy here. Uh, and these differences in copyright policies also limits Wikipedia and sorry Wikimedia projects, uh, especially Wikipedia, to reuse uh, these documents in our uh, projects. In conclusion, uh, I can say uh, that we need to harmonize our uh, policies, especially copyright policies, in uh, like not just in the EU but our primary focus its EU countries, but in the world it will be uh, beneficial. But for now we realize that our uh, like uh, resources and ability is limited. We can uh, work with our countries, uh, uh, legislative institutions and with in the, with, together with uh, such uh, affiliates, Wikimedia affiliates like Wikimedia Europe uh, and all of us is a member of Wikimedia Europe. Uh, can work to promote uh, uh, on our advocacy policies and to allow the different countries to change their copyright policies. Uh, and um, our future steps, if of course we will continue to work on this project, it will be uh, to work more connected between us uh, and develop some strategies to influence our government institutions to change their policies. And uh, also, we are providing the practical tips in our uh, final paper, uh, how to, you can work in your country locally with your uh, like government institutions. It's, about, it's like conduct research. You, know, you, you can use our research as an example and develop your research paper about uh, copyright policies. And uh, in these case studies of, uh, from countries uh, with open access laws can support Wikipedia push for the legislative changes. Uh, it will show you how it be done. Uh, you can uh, develop your outreach uh, program, uh, how to engage with the uh, governmental institutions and uh, cultural institutions to highlight your work and uh, what is the beneficial part of the allowing the freedom of panorama or uh, more access uh, copyright policies. Uh, I say also personal connections. Well, uh, you may say it's not uh, like professional way, but sometimes the personal connections also works well. If you know or if your friends know someone in the uh, like uh, parliament or in government institutions, you can uh, like uh, work with them to provide your uh, voice or our mission to them and explain uh, what we are doing and uh, what will be beneficial for us if you allow the open access copyright policies. And uh, collaborate with uh, advocacy groups. Uh, like in Europe, as we say, all the affiliates, we are working together within the Wikimedia Europe. 
and this is the advocacy group. So I'll uh, also recommend you to find the groups within, within your country uh, who works uh, like nonprofits who works on uh, copyright issues. So uh, you can develop uh, some common uh, outreach program or you can take common steps uh, to influence the uh, people in the parliament or in the government uh, to change uh, copyright policies. Yeah, and that's all from our paper. I will all be shared with you our paper. You can check more information in our papers. Hmm? Only with the experts, not with the viewers. Ah, okay. We'll share it in the coming days. And Madlova is in Georgian. They say thank you. Yeah, if you have any questions, there is some in the chat, but can I see? Ah, okay. Stop presenting. There is question, Eric, about bus. <laughs> what is the bus? I think I hopefully also replied to the question in the in the chat. But for anyone in this room, like we, we had, a, there was a court case between Wikimedia uh, Sweden and uh, and uh, the Visual Art Society, which has the abbreviation BUS or BUS or BUS or however you'd like to pronounce it. Um, who, for anyone who's extremely nerdily interested into copyright uh, laws, I can give a crash course into the court case as any other occasion. But. Yeah, we put this example in our uh, like research paper. Uh, you can read the, the case between Wikimedia Sweden and Buzz there. Uh, or also, Eric can provide more like uh, information via emails to you, uh, how you can like uh, get the knowledge about this case. Any questions for Magman? Anyone? There was just a question in the chat, I think, from Christian, but it may be for anyone, but also Magman. Ah. Uh, DK. Can you, do you want to uh, answer? Yes, it's desirable to have uh, like uh, one policy in EU level because uh, why? Uh, first is that it will allow uh, all countries to have a single copyright policy and it will be beneficial for us as a Wikimedia platform to uh, use all the like uh, governmental documents or databases freely and share with throughout the Wikimedia project. And secondly, it's also beneficial for non-EU members who want to join EU, like Ukraine, Georgia, or Moldova, uh, who works on the, like, to harmonize their copyrights, uh, and not just the copyright policies, but all countries' policies with EU. Uh, so it will allow us to, like, uh, have a benefit from this copyright, single copyright policy. Um, it could be part with uh, DKA, and I think in the next step of our project and some point we'll start, uh, I hope we'll start uh, like work with the Wikimedia Europe to advocate about this, uh, like in national level, also in EU institutions level. But of course, it's the next step of our project. That's uh, a question from Aki. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. So I, I was wondering, you know, what what could be the perceived challenges in having a uniformed EU legislation around copyrights? You know, because right now it seems fairly complicated, you know, where different countries have different uh, legislations, which of course, you know, restricts us in, in the way we could use uh, the materials. But what could be perceived challenges if we were to work on a uniform legislation? Uh, well, main point why uh, different countries use the different uh, copyright policies. Uh, for example, Germany allows freedom of Panora in full capacity, but uh, Italy and France, like blocking even in EU level, 
uh, this uh, like allowing the freedom of panorama. Uh, one is uh, reason is maybe for the commercial purpose, like government don't want like to share their income with uh, different uh, stakeholders, and uh, the commercial use is uh, like very restrictive in that countries. Uh, second idea, maybe uh, governments don't want to share what they have in their hands uh, publicly or under the uh, free license for reuse purposes. Uh, but uh, such countries like Georgia, well, I don't see any reason why we need to uh, like uh, restrict people from the sharing. The only reason can be a commercial purpose, like uh, government wants to make a money. And in case of National Archive of Georgia, that's a case because if even you are taking the picture of archive papers with your mobile phone, you need to pay uh, some amount for the archive. Uh, but when we are like uh, researching their budget, it seems that only 3% of their income is uh, that money. And uh, 97 is provided by the government. I'm still guessing why they are uh, like using restrictive policies. Yeah, income is uh, one of the reasons. Any other questions? Okay. You. Thank you, my boy. Once again, uh, for the viewers, uh, if you have any more questions to our experts, please note them in the chat and we will be responding mm. when we can. <clears throat> and now um, I will invite. Oh, I'm sorry, what happened here? Um, and now I want to invite uh, Alesha from Wikimedia Ukraine, who was in charge of the risks working group. Just give us a second to um, the presentation to. Okay. Can I, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Oleta, uh, you are welcome. Introduce yourself and please go on. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Olesa and I'm uh, from Wikimedia Ukraine, working as a project manager for uh, Wikilos Earth's uh, International Photo Contest and as well leading the um, uh, risks working group for the Heritage Guard Network uh, project. Uh, so now uh, we are going to present the risk working group final papers and its main overview. Uh, starting from the goals of our working group, uh, so the main goals is to explore potential difficulties and challenges uh, regarding uh, cultural and natural uh, heritage, as well as uh, to explore the security concerns for volunteers who are taking pictures in these places, and as well how to ensure that uh, more information is not used to destroy rather than safeguard. Also analyze the intersection between cultural and natural heritage, uh, as well as the how the Wikimedia photo contest can impact more on promoting the safeguarding um, of cultural and natural heritage. And um, identify and compile information about existing uh, cultural and natural heritage uh, institutions that are interested in preserving uh, the heritage and um, Okay. Uh, yes, and especially the uh, heritage that uh, which is at risk. So what we did during um, this uh, time of the project, so we involved uh, seven partners and volunteers in our risks working group, and we conducted uh, several meetings uh, started in May and till July. So we had the presentations from the experts and uh, their insights were also uh, based in our final papers. Um, so then we decided to conduct um, a research and to understand um, 
it more from the perspectives of the institutions and the volunteers because um, probably it is the best way to um, understand um, how uh, understand and answer our questions um, by uh, asking directly the institutions and the volunteers. So we reached those institutions, organizations and experts in cultural and natural heritage field, um, focusing as well uh, on uh, Ukraine, in Ukrainian ones um, and uh, in the Baltic Sea and uh, Sea region. Uh, also, we surveyed uh, volunteers and photographers um, and VT for the contest participants uh, on their safety concerns while photographing heritage sites. So we also received approximately 50 responses. Uh, we uh, tried to reach out to um, a lot of them, like more than 100, but I will tell it later uh, that we faced some challenges with um, also the responses from them. Uh, so just a quick overview of the general structure of the paper. Um, I will be briefly summarizing like the summary of this. Uh, so it contains of the general perspectives, risk and methods of preserving um, Ukraine as a case study, uh, because um, unfortunately now Ukraine is a bright example of why the heritage should be preserved. Uh, and as well as the security concerns for volunteers and um, the a little research by Wikimedia for the contest, um, which role they play regarding the heritage. Uh, so, a bit of general overview. Uh, so, the Central uh, Eastern European and Baltic regions have extensive cultural and natural heritage resources, of course, more than. Um, 120,000 sites have been designated and unfortunately, as we all know, um, a huge part of them uh, face uh, some threats and risks. Um, some of the uh, threats uh, that we um, took from the responses actually, because mostly our research and final papers uh, is um, developed based on uh, the responses uh, from uh, of the surveys. Uh, so, the main ones are environmental and climate risks, uh, as well as public awareness and engagement, digital and technological gaps, uh, war and conflicts, um, and as well a few Ukrainian cases about weak legislation, a lack of oversight, and uh, bureaucracy in um, archaeology, that was the separate case that was mentioned. Uh, we had um, a nice case study from the Kivix Museum and Archives Research Institution in Sweden uh, from our expert David Hermansson. Um, and mostly, um, you can read, of course, more of the uh, detailed uh, insights in the final paper directly, um, but mostly also he mentioned um, some of their uh, researches and findings from their institutions. Um, so the main insights uh, were that uh, risks are also about uh, overexposure to cultural sites. For example, uh, the COVID pandemic highlighted also the vulnerabilities uh, and increased visit damages to fragile areas, uh, as well as the overcrowding or over tourism. Um, it also affected uh, the uh, natural and cultural heritage. Uh, also, commercial, uh, commercialization and mystification. Um, and many cultural sites are losing their uh, authenticity through commercialization uh, with traditional practices or intangible cultural elements. Um, they are being modified for visits of, for visitors. Um, and uh, conflict and cultural uh, ratios, uh, as we will also mention it later, uh, that war has shown that cultural knowledge, knowledge if they want shared, can be targeted strateg strategically by aggressors to, um, in their own purposes. Uh, so the main methods um, for preserving a both cultural and natural heritage are that um, monitoring and protecting measures um, of course, uh, if to regular monitoring of rare species, conservation actions, patrolling by inspectors and using camera traps, 
are employed uh, and public education and awareness are also key components. Uh, establishing protected areas, uh, creating conversation um, areas and enforcing regulations within these zones and standard practices, environmental education and awareness campaigns support these efforts. Uh, also, the Ukrainian case, that inclusion in the Nature Reserve Fund, uh, if, if listing the sites in the Nature Reserve Fund, grants them formal protection, and there is an awareness about the sites uh, seen as uh, also crucial for their preservation. Um, also, documentation in digital preservation. Um, this effort includes cataloging, researching vulnerable sites, promoting public and scientific uh, access via digital platforms, uh, as for example, also using 3G digital archiving. And community involvement, it's about engaging communities to foster understanding and commitment to conservation alongside legislative support, and it also emphasizes a survival approach. Um, so we used in our research Ukraine as a um, special case study. Um, so as an example, as of uh, this year, 2024, Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine has caused uh, extensive damage to its cultural and natural heritage, at least and minimum uh, 1,000 cult cultural and religious buildings uh, have sustained partial or total destructions. Uh, here you can see the example of some uh, damaged or ruined buildings. There are uh, ruined images from um, special nomination of Kikilov's monuments in Ukraine um, 2023. There are, of course, more of them, but, but here is just like some bright examples uh, and the reality that uh, we are facing right now. As well as the natural heritage and the Ukrainian ecosystem also being harshly violated uh, is in, under huge risks, covering more than 44% uh, percentage of the territory and uh, around 30 protected territories have been affected by military operations or Russian occupation. Here you can see just also some example of the picture um, uh, of some military gear, let's say. Um, and uh, this is the photo, um, the winning photo of uh, Vika Love's Earth this year, special nomination, uh, like nature was. Uh, so the ongoing war um, has like, showed us the negative impact on the preserving uh, Ukraine natural and cultural heritage. And if to be more detailed, it's of course, the heritage destruction because war destroyed many cultural monuments and, and still uh, continue to destroy it. Uh, museum collections uh, also increase illegal excavations, um, as well as the environmental impact because the pollution, deforestation, and wildlife displacement from military activities have harmed the ecosystem as well. Um, reduced conservation resources, uh, funds and personals have shifted to defense, uh, so it's weakening heritage protections and uh, um, it's less resources that uh, we had before. Monitoring challenges, um, war prevents monitoring in many regions, while safer areas face increased ecological pressures and digital preservation efforts. Uh, the war has accelerated the digitization of archives to safeguard heritage from further loss. Uh, but despite all of this, Ukraine is currently leading in digitizing archival information, even amid the challenges posed by the ongoing war. And despite very limited resources and uh, uh, without uh, government uh, financial resources, the country Ukraine has successfully digitized uh, 21 million archival items in this 2024 year, and which, which is the first place worldwide compared to other countries, and intending to reach 30 million uh, next year. And um, as well, uh, the next um, important factor uh, for the, um, our research, uh, it was the security of the volunteers. Uh, so, of course, the photographers and volunteers play an essential role in preserving natural and cultural heritage uh, because they are acting as the documenters, advocates, and active participants in conservation efforts uh, because they are capturing heritage at risks. 
raising awareness about uh, the cultural natural heritage sites uh, as well as creating visual archives and uh, they can be like a rapid um, responders in crisis situations um, but um, that was the question for us how do we ensure the total or at least some security for the volunteers while they are trying to make their contribution for uh, preserving the heritage both cultural and natural so we asked uh, the um, uh, uh, participants from the Vikilovs Earth and Vikilovs Monuments uh, in Sea Region uh, about their experience in photographing the protected areas or cultural uh, heritage sites. And as well, based on their responses, 28% uh, 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 percentage of the responders faced risks or situations that exactly were threatening their life. Um, so it's also interesting because they provided some different cases and examples of in which way that was um, a threat for them. Um, but um, most of them uh, didn't encounter such threats uh, with uh, life directly, but they had some another uh, risks. So we divided uh, these risks into physical and mental and emotional risks. So about the physical risks, uh, mostly the responses were about um, uh, falls and injuries that uh, they faced uh, because there were different um, dangerous places like if, for example if it's mountains you can just like uh, go there um, by your own or, or without the special equ equipment uh, also physical access risks to some uh, territories that are not that much accessible and they are protected um fear of getting lost as well weather conditions uh, some animal encounters because also it happens um human conflicts and legal risks um uh, many of the photographers of course faced um like with maybe some questioning from the locals or from the police like why do they do photo photograph photographing in these areas right now, um, as well as the environmental and site related uh, hazards. Um, about the um, mental or emotional risks for the volunteers, uh, it's also about the safety and security concerns. Um, some of the volunteers mentioned, uh, for example, if you're a woman, you can face some. Um, fear of to be kidnapped or some abuse um, it also happens um, also cultural and social tensions uh, fear of breaking the rules and legal issues and frustration and disappointment um, if you didn't face the result that you wanted from this uh, photographing um, place or you know, any other uh, fear uh, but also some of the of course not only about risks but some of the responders mentioned that uh, they had a positive impact uh, while they're photographing um, in the natural and cultural heritage sites um, so well also we asked them uh, which security factors um, in general which factors will make them feel uh, secure and which things they need to uh, know um, or to be done uh, for them to feel secure before they are photography. Uh, so first of all, it's um, planning of your trip uh, or your photography session. It's about, about safety and preparedness. Um, it's better to avoid solo trips, especially in risky areas. Uh, it's better to not to go alone, bring some companion or friend and the first aid kit. Um, also, uh, have special equipment, uh, carry backup gear, and uh, to be prepared for uh, such like logistical situations. As well as the confidence and experience uh, that uh, volunteers had before, uh, because confidence in managing challenging envi environmental uh, situations or not only environmental, um, they um, built, built like more security for the volunteer and they feel maybe more safe. Um, 
uh, and also some experience as well maybe in man managing such situations before. Um, as well as the clear communication and respect, um, it means to engage, <clears throat> engage with locals and uh, maybe to have some uh, people that you know already in this area that can uh, guide you, uh, that can go with you to this place. Um, and um, maybe you can collaborate with them and uh, you will feel more safe than going alone. Uh, and if you need to obtain some permits, uh, to obtain some permits if it's necessary, um, and if you have some conflict, to manage it calmly and adapt to the if the plans uh, are changing. Uh, also, access rules, as we mentioned before, uh, to clarify access for heritage sites, especially restricted or sensitive areas, improve um, uh, signature and guidelines for volunteer access to public uh, monuments. And the legal and ethical standards, um, understanding uh, of the freedom of panorama laws and permissions for photography, maybe private property or in general, um, because uh, if the photographer doesn't know this, um, at least rules, it will be much harder for uh, them to manage this. And also follow ethical guidelines to protect the life inhabitants um, and um, and to feel more um, safe there. Um, and also as a special case, we uh, asked uh, the Ukrainian um, uh, Wikipedia uh, photography and journalist uh, Sergei Petrov about photography in war, conflict, or sensitive areas because he has experience with this, documenting um, uh, uh, documenting the uh, heritage sites uh, that uh, was damaged by uh, uh, by war. And uh, you can read, of course, more in the final papers later about his advice and his uh, perspective. Uh, on how to handle uh, such situation um, uh, as in a Ukrainian case. Um, and the main thing also about Vikilov's Vikilov's monuments uh, uh, competitions, they are uh, now are uh, placed as important tools for raising awareness about the heritage because they are increasing public engagement, expanding digital archives, as we told, also promoting preservation efforts and encouraging sustainable tourism. Uh, but also there are some open questions and the questions that we at least uh, try to find out a bit, but uh, I feel that uh, these questions uh, need to be um, explored more. It's about in which way competitions can play even a bigger role in preserving cultural and natural heritage. And how do we ensure that uploading images to Wikimedia platforms will be used to safeguard the heritage, not to destroy it? Um, so, in general, the conclusion uh, we understood that in this region there are, of course, a diverse uh, amount of institutions and organizations that are dedicated to preserving cultural and natural heritage. Uh, but um, many of these um, institutions, they are um, often difficult to access uh, because we wanted to uh, combine and compile a lot of information and uh, many different uh, interesting insights from different institutions. But we faced with the challenge that um, the response rate is um, really low from the institutions. So we need to uh, maybe for the future project find out how to um, maybe make warm contacts or to the, uh, have to access them better. And again, Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine serves as a, a very bright illustration of the uh, impact uh, that armed conflict can have on both cultural and natural heritage. And the role of volunteers and photographers in preserving the heritage is uh, very positive, but uh, their security must be a priority. Uh, for us. And some of the reflections that we made, um, it's maybe to conduct in the future some security tra trainings for photographers and volunteers uh, because um, they can play a really critical role in ensuring personal safety and the protection of 
sensitive locations uh, and um, this can be very beneficial for the uh, for the competitions uh, participants um, as well as i mentioned before the open question is the wikipedia as a platform for preserving um, maybe there are some researches but um, need to understand uh, a more complex uh, conduct more complex research and why wikipedia is a safe or maybe unsafe place for cultural natural heritage preserving because um, as uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, from some of our experts, uh, this is the free platform which can be dangerous to cultural and natural heritage because it can be used for every purpose and human mind can set up. Uh, conducting a field inventory, uh, Lyudmila was uh, talking about this before, so I will not um, stop in here in more details. Um, but it's also an um, important point for the future and, of course, more extensive initiative for exploring more questions and, um, uh, uh, and other uh, goals. Thank you so much. You can access final papers. Um, just click on this link. And if you have some questions or suggestions or what we should explore more, please leave the, your suggestions in the chat. And that also as part of my presentation, I want to present um, Darina, uh, who is a project manager from Wikimedia Ukraine for Wikilove's monuments. And she will talk uh, also on the topic of cultural heritage uh, preserving and the special case from Wikilove's monuments. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so today I will tell you about uh, Polish heritage special category uh, in Wikilove's monuments in Ukraine as a case of partnership across borders. Uh, so my name is uh, Darina and uh, I'm project manager of Wikilove's monuments in Ukraine. Also, I'm an editor of Wikipedia and some sister projects from 2017. Uh, so let's start a little bit uh, with Wikilove's monuments uh, in Ukraine overview. Uh, our country joined the competition in 2012, uh, and uh, this was a year when uh, our volunteers uh, actually created uh, the first public electronic database of monuments of Ukraine, which now contains more than uh, 100,000 objects. And uh, what is more important, uh, this work is still not completed, uh, so we are working uh, more. Uh, when uh, the war started in Ukraine in 2014, uh, our competition um, continues, but uh, of course uh, it becomes uh, uh, more difficult uh, to conduct it in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, in 2022, when the full-scale uh, Russian invasion started in Ukraine, uh, the country uh, took part uh, uh, and uh, continue taking part, but uh, of course uh, there are some uh, limitations of the photo creation date uh, just because of safety reasons. Uh, here in the slide you can also see the photo which uh, won uh, the fourth uh, place in the international level the previous year, so we are very happy to have this prize. Uh, and uh, as uh, Alessa has already mentioned, uh, of course, uh, since uh, the full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, by Russian army has started in February 2022, there are a lot of uh, monuments uh, already destroyed or damaged. Uh, UNESCO um, has verified uh, uh, more than uh, 450 cultural sites damaged uh, as for October 16. Uh, but uh, the Ministry of Culture and uh, Strategic Communications of Ukraine has confirmed even more cases. Uh, so there are more than 2,000 cultural heritage sites already damaged. And unfortunately, this uh, continues and the amount is uh, even bigger. Uh, so also, I want to share with you one more challenge uh, that we have in Ukraine. If you are talking about the database of monuments, uh, Ukraine, as you may know, was a part of Soviet Union, and in that uh, time, uh, the first uh, database of Ukrainian monuments uh, was created. Uh, but uh, Ukrainian heritage uh, was completely ignored uh, by the Soviet Union uh, government. 
and uh, of course uh, the minorities heritage was uh, often ignored as well for example jewish german polish italian hungarian um, and uh, so on minorities uh, were ignored uh, and uh, this minority heritage uh, is uh, at even higher risk of destruction, of course, because uh, there is uh, no or very small active communities now in Ukraine which actually cares about uh, these monuments. Uh, so from 2013, uh, we decided to organize uh, some special categories uh, in uh, our competition. Uh, to uh, increase awareness of people that there are also monuments uh, connected with uh, some uh, minorities in our country and uh, also build uh, interesting partnerships. Uh, this year we are very uh, proud that we organized uh, the first time a Polish Heritage Special Category with the help of uh, our partners Wikimedia Polska. Uh, and uh, the special category is dedicated to Polish cultural heritage in Ukraine. Uh, as uh, you may know, uh, the, um, uh, due to the common history, uh, there are a lot of uh, Polish uh, monuments in the territory of uh, modern Ukraine. Uh, and unfortunately, not all of them uh, are uh, registered and uh, protected by the government. Uh, so, with this special category, we are trying to pay more attention uh, and uh, also document uh, these monuments. You can see also on our slide some uh, statistic. Uh, there are more than 4,600 um, photos uh, right now and uh, more than 100 people took part. So, it's really amazing a statistic, I would say. Uh, but I want to share with you one funny story, actually, which I believe is very important uh, and interesting uh, to show why the special category is so important. So in Ukraine, in one small town, which is called uh, Czorny Ostry, uh, we have uh, one Polish uh, uh, cemetery. Uh, here you can see on the slide uh, that the cemetery has a gate uh, and it's uh, a cultural architectural monument of local importance uh, in this small town. So a lot of photographers uh, have taken pictures of these gates and uploaded to Wikilove's monuments uh, for several years. But no one uh, has uh, entered actually the cemetery and took photos of what is inside. Uh, and only this year, uh, when we have the Polish Heritage Special Category, uh, there are pictures of the ceremony uh, cemetery itself. Uh, so this story, it's uh, kind of uh, fun, but it's a very important example that Wikipedia receives uh, the photos of this uh, monument only right now, after the Special Category has uh, established. And our partnership, uh, of course, is very important uh, for this achievement. Uh, so thank you uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments, uh, or feedback, uh, please uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, here you can see on the slide uh, of uh, official uh, website, uh, email, Facebook, uh, Instagram. So we will be happy to hear more suggestions uh, from you and share our experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darina. Uh, Darina was our special guest, uh, like a surprise for all of you. And I'm very glad that you joined us. Uh, and uh, thank you for the initiative uh, of the special category. It was the first time that we experimented with it. And I think it perfectly fits the Heritage Guard Network project is like um, a case study that we can show of why are we doing this. So thank you one, once again. There are some comments in the chat, but perhaps someone wants to ask a question to Alesha or Darina uh, right now uh, before we start um, our lunch break. Okay, thank you. So I, I wanted to know a little bit more about the um, the archival digitization project. It seems like a huge project that, that was done in uh, in a very short time. So could you tell us more about it? Um, that was the um, 
inside with regards on some of the cultural events in Ukraine. Uh, so the panelists were talking about uh, actually about uh, this topic and that was like the main answer from it. Um, I can share you later more details on this, uh, but um, despite the war, I guess it was like, it still was the priority for the uh, Ukrainian institutions to digitize archival information and it's still uh, relevant. So they, um, I guess, um, put a lot of efforts to digitize it and um, they continue doing it. Uh, and that was also for me a very interesting fact, um, by the way. Um, yes, I, I can find maybe more information on this and share. Um, but um, yeah, let's see, maybe in the next year we'll have uh, even more. Because now I guess um, we understand um, even like the, the, more, the more priority and the more relevance for uh, preserving and uh, digitizing the information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one person uh, raising a hand, Jana. Yes, um, Johanna Fris Markevich from the Swedish National Archive. I would just like to say that the big digitization project in Ukraine is in cooperation with Family Search, who is uh, has a long tradition since the 20, early 20th century to microfilm or digitize genealogic material in archives and libraries. Thank you. Yes, that, that, that's a great example. We have been to the archives. Um, thanks, Wikimedia Sweden. Eric, do you have some comment? Do you know about this project? Uh, definitely not more than uh, Johanna, uh, Johanna knows, but I, I, I think it's interesting. Also, because the, the, the Swedish uh, National Archives doing a project um, but I think it's very interesting, like trying to kind of match match information from Ukrainian uh, history with documents that is in the Swedish National Archives, given that Sweden once upon a time was kind of quite far into uh, Central and Eastern Europe with armies and everything. Um, so there's a lot of content from the region in the Swedish National Archives as well, which is like, you know, I think it's an interesting approach to try to use this very unfortunate occasion to, to still um, improve digitized more material and, and enrich this material with more metadata. So along those lines, I also think it was very interesting the comment from David in the in the chat, like um, which I also think was very much in line with Darina's uh, like um, uh, presentation. You know, we, we tend to think very much like in national like mm -hmm. categories. We work in Sweden, we work in Poland, we work in Ukraine, but we have such a like complex history, you know, borders that are moving and different countries being, you know, in different parts of the of Europe uh, and so on. So really interesting to think about like the intersections between countries and how we can use um, archival and, and uh, uh, information from cultural heritage institutions to, to enrich and, and broaden the horizon. I don't know how to put it. Thank you for all the comments and questions. Uh, and now uh, we are starting our lunch break, one hour lunch break. We will be back in an hour and I hope our guests online uh, will have some rest and a good meal as well. Uh, so see you in an hour and after the break, uh, we are going to have another two presentations from Technology and Content Working Group and Engagement Working Group soon and thank you very much for this part so far welcome everyone after the lunch break uh, i hope you had something delicious as we did and now <laughs> and now uh it's time for um next two presentations from our working groups and first will be eric Luf from wikimedia sweden presenting uh the work of technology working group eric please join in Thank you, Natalia. I hope that everyone sees me uh, well. Um, as Natalia said, my name is Eric Luth, and I, I work for the Swedish chapter of the Wikimedia movement and also a part of the 
uh, project team behind the Heritage Guard network. Um, I was also uh, leading the specific working group that has worked on technology. Uh, and uh, the question that we tried to reply to, or at least start pondering in this working group was, um, when it comes to digitizing and making available cultural and natural heritage in danger on the Wikimedia platforms, how can then technology and content be used to enable Wikimedians to do efficient and professional work while lowering barriers for newcomers and non-professionals to join in, uh, which is in itself a very large scope. So we try to narrow it down and, and actually reach a few tangible insights. And these are the insights that I would try to focus on during this presentation. I also think that it's important to acknowledge like this kind of uh, binarity between like on the one hand making sure that we do a more efficient and professional work but without ending up in a situation where that's too difficult for volunteers to engage in i mean the foundation for the wikimedia movement is all those hundreds of thousands of volunteers across the world that spend their leisure their free time on taking photos writing articles adding data so how can we support them in doing uh, a, a more efficient uh, work um, without kind of you know killing their enthusiasm and, or motivation. Uh, so that's also one of the things that we try to bear, bear in mind during the work with this in this working group. So in this working group, we have had three meetings with uh, experts and, and volunteers from the Wikimedia movement to try to uh, dive into the question. Uh, and these meetings has uh, have informed the, the paper uh, or the, the part of the paper that will be published after this conference and also to and I added two exclamation marks after draft because I want to say that they are very much drafts but still to draft checklists on uh, documentation of protected cultural and natural heritage on the Wikimedia platforms and I will come back a bit more into why I think why we thought that those checklists were needed um, but a few very general conclusions uh, from the work in the working groups and also the, the desk review that has taken place afterwards is firstly that of course there are huge gaps on both maybe especially on Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons and of course also on Wikipedia but that these gaps uh, in, in data um, is an impediment to volunteer involvement, the prioritization of the work of the volunteer involvement, reuse of the content on maybe especially Wikimedia Commons and thus also the reach of the content and the possibility to do research on the content and eventually on the content partnerships. So like what, what, what we're trying to say with this is, is that when you don't have data, then the entire flow of how knowledge is spread is impeded in different ways. So for example, maybe to, to begin with, like uh, when it comes to volunteer involvement, we know that one of the large obstacles for, for um, uh, users or user groups or Wikimedia affiliates to join in, for example, Wikilove Surf and Wikilove's Monuments, two of the large photo campaigns of the Wikimedia movement, is the lack of uh, for registers, so the la lack of data on protected monuments or natural sites in a given country or in a given region. Uh, so when you don't have that data, then it's very difficult for communities to actually join in and even start crowdsourcing information through campaigns such as Wikilove's Monuments and Wikilove's Earth. Um, also, when you don't have data about what those sites contain, it's difficult to understand as a volunteer and also like as an organizer, where should the work of those volunteers be, be guided? What is the most important for these volunteers to do? Uh, how, like if we have, I mean, there is a certain amount of volunteer hours, how can we make sure that these volunteer hours are used in the best way? Um, still, uh, like as, I, as we write in the paper, I think there's like what, more than 1.6 million objects or something like that made available on, only through Wikimedia or Wikilabs monuments. And that's a huge size of objects for digital reproductions. Um, the real value of these reproductions is, is of course when, when it's used, when it's used in Wikipedia articles, when it's used in publications, when it's used in books. Um, but you need to have the metadata about those objects to make them findable or to make it possible for people that want to find a reproduction, a photograph, for example, to use it. So I, I could continue like this for ages. I, I think that the, the, the kind of insight is perhaps clear. We need to have both uh, data about the sites and, and the contain. Uh, uh, I hear myself in an echo. Um, uh, we need to have data about the size of what they contain, but also metadata about the reproductions on Wikimedia Commons, for example. So that's one of the general conclusions. Uh, another one is that technical barriers still remain a big hurdle for volunteers as well as professionals to join 
the work. It's seen as complicated to add, for example, photos to Wikimedia Commons, and perhaps even more difficult to add data to Wikidata. Um, and a third general conclusion that perhaps falls a bit outside of this, but that is very important as we understand that for heritage professionals is 3D, digi 3D um, digitization, not only digitizing in a two-dimensional two form, but in three-dimensional form. And here is an obvious um, limitation in what the technology behind MediaWiki, like the software that Wikipedia and the other Wikimedia platforms use, enable. Uh, and the same goes for map vis visualization, which we have found out is extremely important when it comes to uh, getting volunteers to join in, for example, Wikilove Surf and Wikilove's monuments. So that's a few very high level general conclusions. Um, a few other perhaps insights is like, uh, and as a starting point, of course, that reproductions uh, on the Wikimedia platforms, like photos, videos, wherever it might be, of cultural and natural heritage are very highly valued. Uh, we have spoken with several experts, for example, at different kind of natural national uh, heritage organizations that say that in many countries they don't like, anymore have like photographers that take official photographs of, of monuments, but rather they rely on Wikimedia uh, information, like photos of Wikimedia Commons, for example, in their professional work. So the the of course there's a high value of having a photo in a Wiki, Wikipedia article. But I think that we should also always remind ourselves that the value is very large also outside of the Wikimedia sphere. Like freely licensed content on cultural and natural heritage is of a large value across society. Um, but something that, I, that we have also realized through this work is that, I mean, sometimes I think in the Wikimedia movement, and maybe especially in Wikilove's Monuments and Wikilove's Earth, is that we, we have this list of monuments, and when all of them have a photo, then we're done. Now we can kind of close with Love's Monuments or with Love's Earth in this country. But many professionals say, no, 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 please don't stop using uh, like crowd crowdsourcing in this way, because from a professional point of view, uh, they need to have several reproductions of the same object and preferably also having reproductions over time. They can see like a photo of a monument in 2015 and 2025 and then in 2035 and whatever. Uh, but, and also in different seasons, of course, if they have it over different years, they, they can see like how how time, like passage of time impacts the monument. But also if you have it in different seasons, you can see it in different light, you can see how it interacts with snow or with sun or with whatever kind of uh, weather element you're considering. Um, and that's one thing that I, I, I hadn't been con thinking as much about like before this work and how can we kind of support volunteers in taking like photos of the same thing over and over again. I mean, typically, for example, if you have a list uh, with monuments on Wikipedia, then you see like this is already has a, a photo in like a box and then below there's like a question mark instead. So then you go for the, for the monument that has a question mark, which means that it doesn't have a photo, uh, whereas it might be uh, equally important to actually have yet another photo of the same uh, monument that was already photographed. Um, a third insight is that there seems to be more and more discussion in the Wikimedia movement how to support her heritage preservation. Uh, I know that a lot of people in this call have been a part or leading those discussions, but I want to acknowledge in this way also that we are, of course, not, not like operating in, in a vacuum, but we're you know, building on and collaborating with a work that has already been done. Um, a fourth insight was like, the in extreme importance of adding more data sets to, to Wikidata, uh, which is like the structured link uh, database of the Wikimedia movement. Um, I like quite a common line of work is that volunteers manually develop a list, especially if you're like maybe in a like new or emerging um, um, community, you uh, uh, manually develop a list of. Uh, heritage object, be it cultural or natural. And then kind of when you get more mature, like in, in, in the work of the community, then you add this data to Wikidata. But that also takes like the, the information one step away from the original database. So when something happens in the, in the database behind it, then you need like to manually update this in two places, both on Wikipedia and in Wikidata. And there's like a big risk that, you know, information quickly gets out of date. So when we work, work directly to try to link databases with each other, 
then that also kind of increases the opportunity, the, the, the likelihood that data will automatically be updated in at all places. Uh, and also, of course, for another, I think, important reason within the Wikimedia movement, which is like a movement that is very passionate about language, of course, Wikidata is also a multilingual platform. So if you add the information on Wikidata, then you can reflect it automatically in Polish or Ukrainian or Swedish or whatever language where you actually have in which you have data about the objects. Um, a few of the issues, perhaps, that uh, we have many, I think, issues. We could spend the entire day about issues. Uh, but um, like we have realized through this work the huge thematic and geographic gaps that we have on the Wikimedia platforms in terms of both data and content. And also, when we kind of find databases or content that would be a very high value uh, for the Wikimedia movement, how unclear intellectual property rights, as Mechman was talking about in, in the first presentation, constitutes a constant obstacle. And in many cases, it might even be like the, the, the potential partner that has a database would like us to use the database, but it's so, so difficult to understand what the database rights actually look like and how they interact like with uh with our licenses and so on so that even though there's like a willingness from both partners like the unclarity around intellectual property rights means that the database can't be linked to or added to wiki to wikidata um and the last of those insights is perhaps the crucial importance of uh, developing more tools and welcoming interfaces to all the time to try to continue to lower barriers for newcomers if I like try to zoom in for a while on the natural heritage specifically, uh, one of the things that we have realized uh, in, in the work of the working group is uh, the lack of data, especially on Wikidata, about uh, species and geographic distribution of species. So in many countries, there might be good data about the natural sites in themselves. But if you're not an expert on biodiversity or biology if you see that i should go to this natural site and i have no idea what it contains it's really difficult as a volunteer to know actually what to what to do, what to document so often we might end up with a lot of photos photos of waterfalls because the volunteer thinks that the waterfall is beautiful and of course it is beautiful but but the waterfall is maybe not what exactly what actually makes this natural heritage site protected or important in terms of biodiversity um, so one hypothesis is that better reflection of geographic distribution of species on Wikidata could also be a way of making it easier for volunteers to understand what to actually document when they get to, uh, for example, na nature reserve. Uh, if they know that in this area it's this mushroom or this bird or this, um, it, I mean, it can of course also be like a, a an ecosystem, this uh, kind of marsh or something, that's what makes this area valuable. And it's easier for a volunteer to uh, to kind of, I don't want to say document the right thing, but document the thing that kind of makes the site uh, the most valuable, or that in the first place makes it protected. Um, but I think that there's a lot of conceptual work uh, needed to match uh, like biodiversity data in general with uh, with Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons. And this is also something which we see in the research that has been done on Wikipedia, Wikidata, and biodiversity. There's been some proposals to develop something like the Scolia uh, tool, which is, I, I don't know if, how many are familiar with that, but that's like a way of kind of visualizing research and the impact of researchers. But could that perhaps be done with the open data on Wikidata to visualize biodiversity instead? Uh, and a third insight is the importance of of uh, shape files. Uh, that is like um, data that show the geographic extension of nature uh, natural sites. Like because if, if you have a monument, many monuments might be in one place. If you have coordinates, that's like good enough. You know that if I go to this uh, to to these coordinates, then I will find the statue. But for for nature reserves, I mean they typically cover a large geographic area. So you might if you only see the coordinates you don't know like where this nature reserve like actually uh, what the surface of this na natural reserve actually looks like um, and 
there is a lack of te technical capacity within the Wikimedia platforms to vis visualize the shapefiles, and there's also a huge lack of freely licensed shapefiles to add to Wikimedia Commons in the first place. Uh, Sweden is the only country we have found at this point where there is a complete set of shapefiles on Wikimedia Commons, and there's a few from Czechia as well, but otherwise there's like a very big lack of, uh, of shapefiles on nature, uh, protected nature on Wikimedia Commons. Um, I also took to like just brought down two maps from um, the query service of Wikimedia Commons to try to illustrate the lack of data of geographic distribution of species on, on Wikimedia Commons. So, so we asked um, the query service of Wikimedia Commons, like all the observations of uh, to the to the left, as you see it, is like hedgehog, like one of the, I think, cutest animals that exist. Like these are all the, like if you ask Wikimedia Commons, which um, photos have been taken of hedgehogs uh, in Europe, then this is the reply. And obviously there are much more photos of hedgehogs in Europe on Wikimedia Commons than these kind of, what, what might it be, like 30 or something, uh, but they don't have this as metadata. So that makes it impossible to query or search for findings of hedgehogs in Europe. Uh, and then the one to the to the right uh, is like uh, an endangered big bird. I think it's like goshawk. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Goshawk, goshawk. Like it is a big, big, beautiful endangered uh, bird. But the only sighting in Europe is actually here in Poland, uh, outside of Katowice, where a lot of us went to Wikimania uh, earlier this year. So that that's according to uh, Wikimedia Commons, the only sighting in Europe of. European goshawk, however, however to pronounce it, which is obviously not the case. But so this just to illustrate the importance of having this kind of metadata about the images. And to try to quickly touch base on a few insights on cultural heritage as well, is that like our finding is that it seems like cultural heritage preservation on Wikimedia is more mature than natural heritage. A lot of issues, of course, still exist. Uh, but there has been more work to match data sets like from external partners with Wikidata, upload such data sets and also improve the metadata about the about the content that already exists. Um, but something that we have done le much less around is to try to work with partners and volunteers to kind of try to develop different models of how can we use the data that we now have to prioritize the work of the volunteers in a meaningful way. Again, without killing the motivation and uh, enthusiasm of the, of the volunteers, uh, but how can we uh, proactively try to make sure that, you know, if something happens, if there is a, if there is a flood or if there is a, if, if war spreads or whatever it might be, like how, how can we make sure that things have already proactively been documented? How can we try to prioritize the documentation of especially valuable and vulnerable uh, objects of cultural heritage. Uh, another insight is the important importance of work, working with volunteers to enrich the cultural heritage metadata. Because something that we have found is that quite often like the metadata that you might get from cultural heritage institutions is quite uh, limited um, and that there's a big opportunity or like a big uh, chance to work with Wikimedians to improve this uh, to improve this metadata. But to do this, we need to have better and more efficient tools. One obstacle that we see over and over again is that maybe from like less mature organizations, you get like a PDF. That's like the metadata that you get, uh, and it's quite time consuming to try to manually turn those PDFs into into Wikidata uh, form. And like to continuing to to improve tools like the ISA tool to add structured data to uh, objects on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, so more work with data and maybe especially structured data and commons uh, is crucial for volunteer engagement. It's easier to kind of, I don't want to say steer, but easier to guide volunteers in how to like do the most important work, but also of course to make sure that the content is findable for Wikipedians and also for others that want to reuse the information. Um, so the kind of concrete outcomes that we have uh, reached to, and I just, just want to see where I am with time, uh, the, the concrete outcomes from uh, from the working group so far is that we have developed, as I mentioned, two checklists on uh, digital documentation, uh, and they try to capture a bit of what I've been talking about. So when like a 
a volunteer goes to a, to a natural site or a, or a cultural heritage site, um, what should they try to capture? If they see a building, like typically what is important to capture in the building? Um, so with the support of cultural heritage experts, we have developed lists of, you know, this is what you should look for at the roof. And these, are, th these kind of wi windows are important to capture. And this is like how you do it. Like this is the, the parts of the surrounding that you should try to capture and so on to make it easier for a volunteer to understand like how to actually document in a, I don't want to say in a professional way, but in a maybe more mature way or in a way that kind of, that makes the reproductions valuable uh, and not only beautiful. Beautiful is important, but valuable is also important. Um, and that we need to work more on trying to make the tools and lists more layered. I think we, many of us like work quite binary, binarily at the moment. It's photographed or it's not photographed, uh, but maybe we can find ways of visualizing this in a more complex way uh, to make it easier for volunteers to kind of understand how to, how to, um, uh, like what what they should focus on when they plan their with the loves campaigns for example um yeah and i think that's might be it i hope that it made sense uh, i felt like i was just talking super quickly for for 22 minutes or whatever um but that's it for me uh you can see my contact details i think at the bottom if anyone has any questions afterwards um i don't know if there's anyone has any questions or thoughts or comments Ready. I can stop the screen. I can. Uh, yes. And then see the questions. And then this. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to go. Uh, that's not a um, uh, question, I think. Okay, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, very much. To respond to your last question, it makes a lot of sense, <laughs> I think, for all of us here and, and online. Uh, I also believe that hedgehog is my spirit animal, so I was particularly touched when you showed Max. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, now we are moving to, 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 to my presentation, uh, which is going to be the last presentation from, uh, from our working group since engagement working group uh, is the fourth. Uh, so let me just share the screen. Okay. Do you see the presentation? I know you do. <laughs> yes, you see it online as well. Thank you, Thank you Anton. Mm, okay, and um, engagement working group um, was uh, led by Wikimedia Polska and together with Kamila Neumann, who is here with us. Uh, I had the pleasure to um, lead this group um, and just a quick look at what was the what was our basic scope um, well to put it simply we just wanted to know we wanted to find out how to best engage stakeholders but mainly volunteers uh, into crowdsourcing initiatives um, both in short and long term of course um, so we can safeguard the natural and cultural, cultural heritage uh, through Wikimedia platforms uh, of course, we had a lot of questions to answer. We did not manage to answer all of them. Some of them probably we, we never will, um, but it was a crucial work for us because uh, these are the volunteers that we work with on our daily basis. Um, so understanding their motivations, um, their values, and, and just checking what makes them stay in a project um, is of utmost value for everything that we do in Wikimedia not just for uh, for the heritage um so what we did we have we had more or less 12 volunteers uh the group meetings were open to anyone so some people were on every meeting other people were just on one meeting people were coming and going or coming back 
Um, but we had also experts and partner organizations joining in uh, at a certain moment, uh, giving us feedback or, or sending uh, some sources um, for, for our desk research. Uh, so it was a very collaborative um, work and also we did some experiments. Um, we used some surveys uh, and, and, the, and we tried to do like a small benchmark. As I said at the beginning, it's a seed project, so uh, we didn't have time to, to make like super big research, but just like a basic benchmark of, of for example, crowdsourcing initiatives that were uh, successful and we can learn from them. And in the final paper that we'll sh uh, share with you um, after the event, you will see uh, some examples. Uh, we analyzed a lot of case studies, mainly from Wikimedia, uh, because it turned out that uh, here in the Wikimedia movement, there are already so many uh, initiatives uh, aimed at safeguarding heritage that sometimes we were even surprised um, because uh, we are not aware of how many are there. Uh, sometimes the people that, do, do are, that are involved are not connected anyhow. And at times it felt like we are reinventing the wheel um, in different initiatives, but at the same time we realized that we are the net, we are the Heritage Guard Network already, uh, sort of. Uh, and we did a lot of work on communication. Uh, it was thanks to Jolanta Czewakowska, our communications manager, who joined the project uh, like spontaneously because it, it was not planned, uh, but she helped us greatly with communicating the outcomes of, uh, of our work and just joining in with her insights on how to communicate such initiatives as such. Um, so I will just give you a key insights, not all of them, you will find more in, in the paper. Um, so volunteer engagement and psychological well-being are, are, are like two key concepts uh, that accompanied us during our work and everywhere we checked, we ended up with this conclusion that um, it is absolutely, absolutely important to take care of that psychological, psychological well-being and that uh, for people in order to, to come and stay in an initiative, there needs to be some sort of emotional attachment to the topic, uh, to the organization and, and its mission. Uh, and there are various ways of uh, enhancing it. Uh, and the, the, this kind of lo loyalty um, can be built through like, meaningful, well-defined roles within a certain project. And it has to resonate somehow with people's values and interests. Uh, it just has to be important personally for, for the ones that you want to um, involve. Um, so, of course, providing volunteers with purposeful tasks that align with their personal goals uh, will have a crucial impact or, on their satisfaction. Um, and they were probably be more likely to stay uh, involved long term. I know it's like a very smart sentence uh, and the hard thing is to do it actually, but in later uh, insights, you will see that we sort of try to break down um, that issue into, into smaller parts. Um, so this insight is super important in, in, in case of uh, heritage safeguarding. Uh, so Going further, going deeper into the topic, and um, there were many uh, case studies and also research uh, that um, helped us un understand um, what exactly do we need to take care of in terms of those psychological elements. Um, so we, we discovered that volunteers are most motivated when they feel some kind of connection, personal connection to the heritage they are helping to preserve. It is either by having a nice memory with the place or some childhood memory, or just um, feeling that this part of heritage kind of belongs to their cultural background or anything else that makes them feel personally attached to, um, to that heritage. And here's where communication comes in because uh, we will not be able to have any impact as a heritage guard network if we don't uh, adjust our narrative to suit these uh, insights that I'm, that I'm telling you now. Uh, we can use communication as a tool to either, uh, we can help people discover this att att attachment. Uh, some people may not be aware that 
they, uh, but the heritage that is around them is actually super important for them. But communication using visuals, uh, language, narratives, storytelling can uh, incentivize this. And, and, and we experimented a little. Uh, this, the, this is what Yolanta prepared for some of our presentations. You know, you know during all these months when, uh, when we were working, we were doing different presentations in different countries and conferences. And sometimes we would uh, have this play with the audience, uh, like showing one picture with and the second one without uh, a very well-known um, piece of heritage. Uh, and it was fun. It was engaging, but at the same time, we were uh, trying to see if how it works, if it works. Uh, and um, other research that we um, that we looked into uh, told us that people are most willing to join an initiative in the when they feel that they can save something from um, from danger, from from getting lost, uh, from vanishing. So the vanishing object, as Yolanta called it, was uh, a communication experiment that that, um, that we had during the work of uh, of our group. And the picture at, at the bottom is very uh, on time, I suppose. Uh, but I just maybe I could um, add some more pictures that we had. But I will try to uh, attach them to um, to the final paper. Uh, and. An important part for uh, of our conversations was actually uh, UX user uh, experience in terms of uh, digital design, um, and there's a lot of um, many insights in the final paper uh, will be uh, related to to this part. Uh, I mean, user friendliness uh, is also like uh, a fashionable word, uh, and here in Wikimedia, we I believe we have a lot to do still in terms of UX design. Uh, but it's just that when we when uh, when we started to uh, focus on on research in that matter, we discovered that there is definitely a direct correlation between UX design and volunteers motivation and engagement. Uh, so exploring this topic is valid for the Heritage Guard Network. Um, and and to, 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 to give you some details, um, UX design can help us focus on intrinsic motivators, such as personal satisfaction, ease of contribution, community support, every, everything actually that we are already trying to, to provide in, in our Wikimedia activities. Uh, social proof, like for example, testimonials, uh, when people want to join our initiative and they see, for example, their peers or some people that um, that they admire uh, saying or showing like, OK, I, I joined this too. This is important for us. This is important for our generation, for our region, for our country, for our neighborhood, if it's a very local initiative. Uh, and regular feedback, like having, uh, having digital design that actually enables uh, regular communication in both sides. Um, and uh, we noted that intuitive design and accessibility features help create simply an inclusive environment. Um, so if we want to have broad audience, we need to have tools that encourage this audience. Um, and I believe, as Eric also said, um, navigating through Wikimedia Commons, Wikimedia, uh, Wikidata, and some other Wikimedia projects is not always that intuitive still, even though uh, we, we keep working on that. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, we discovered so many case studies across Wikimedia that we realized that we, we have this capacity, we have the power to, to, to safeguard the heritage. Uh, it's just that perhaps we should cooperate a little bit more here internally uh, having external experts is super important, but recognizing internal experts is as important. Uh, and we do have case studies, uh, fantastic case studies, like Wiki Loves Monuments, Wiki Loves Earth, Wiki Loves Fol Folklore, and they are successful models in what we want to achieve. We want to have newcomers. Um, we want to have volunteers, I'm sorry, um, doing, uh, doing photographs. 
uh, adding wiki data related to all sorts of heritage. And this is this is happening, maybe not to a scale that we are aspiring at the Heritage Na Guard Network, but there is like a precedence. Uh, there is something we can we can already base on. Um, and it's just a matter of finding a way to to engage more people into that and also insight insights from uh from those campaigns mentioned here were very important for for our group to to understand um how can we improve actually that um volunteer motivation so so such initiatives do illustrate that wikimedia can function both as a preservation platform and a means to expand public engagement with, with heritage it's uh, we have it all we just need to uh i don't know improve it use it better and know how to promote it um uh and as 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 my colleagues from uh from other working groups also said we have to keep addressing technical barriers to, to, to improve volunteer access. Uh, many volunteers may feel intimidated by, for example, Wikimedia Commons uploading process, or uh, they may be unsure of copyright policies. All of this is a barrier, is an entrance barrier. And uh, I'm sure we can find ways to, to, to lower that, um, that, that barrier, and, and we should, definitely, because we know the answers, right? Um, Uh, and something that our volunteers are, and experts often mentioned is that when thinking of heritage uh, in the long term, we should definitely uh, engage with um, indigenous com communities uh, because they possess deep rooted, uh, sometimes oral knowledge about cultural and natural heritage that is um, absolutely unique. We cannot find it in, in, in many sources. Uh, and we do have initiatives within Wikimedia movement that do also this, uh, and we can learn from their experiences uh, because it, 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 it strengthens ties between the projects and local cu cultural custodians. Uh, and sometimes we are able to identify them. Uh, there are some projects that we do in Poland, for example, like um, Wikipedia na Kurpia uh, which is a which is an ethnographical project. Um, that is led by one of our board members, Maria Veronika Kmoch, and uh, it's a project in my home region, uh, actually, um, and it, it's been ongoing for uh, for years, and it bases on we could say indigenous um, indigenous people, communities, customs, uh, helping helping them, supporting them, and safeguarding their their traditions which obviously with every generation are not that obvious anymore. Um, and uh, of course, also to strengthen what my colleagues said, uh, we should be thinking about utilizing advanced digital tools for heritage documentation and restoration. Um, in Poland, we cooperate, uh, for example, with Instytut Korpantego, um, who supports um, digitizing heritage, um, like literally, on site uh, with something that they call Digibus. It, it, it's literally a bus uh, going going from village to village. And inside the bus, there's a whole uh, infrastructure like scanners and, and, and those kind of devices. Uh, so you don't have to take away <laughs> anything from there and, and, and take it to the museum. You can, you can scan things. Like, where they are, uh, you can check family stories, uh, for example. Um, and the tool that Paki showed, the heritage, heritage damage assessment demo, um, uh, is, is an amazing example of, of what we can do when we combine technology um, with uh, content that is delivered uh, sometimes by, by non-professionals. Uh, which is exactly what we are aiming for. We want to uh, we want to get content from as many people as possible, not just not just expert, but we want to provide those people with instructions on how to do it best. Um, and just 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 a final conclusion, um, and it's like an essence of 
of uh, what we discovered with the engagement uh, working working group. Um, maybe some of you have seen recently there's an ongoing uh, campaign by Wikimedia Foundation uh, and, and Wikimedia movement as such um, with a tagline knowledge is human uh, because we want to show that even though this is an internet project there are always people behind it like Wikipedia, Wikimedia volunteers are um, are particular people with their interests and their passion, um, their volunteer engagement. And actually, when we arrived uh, at a point where we had the, all the conclusions from the uh, engagement working group, uh, we decided, yes, this is this is a perfect example of of the tagline of no knowledge is human. Uh, we see that it's just more than data uh, or or information. Um, heritage that we are trying to safeguard is an expression of community, of memory, of, of shared values, um, and by preserving it as, as, as we want to in our project, um, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, making the, 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 the ideal of having the sum of human knowledge come into existence, uh, but it's also um, about carrying, you know, lots of personal stories particular people, families, um, tribes, uh, countries, uh, regions, and, and it, it brings emotions um, and, and it makes people uh, more connected to, um, to, 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 to the heritage and, and, and to our project. So, so the human factor is and always will be absolutely crucial and, and humans as, as creatures um, they have emotions, and, and this is just what we really have to um, acknowledge. Um, yeah, so so this project reminds us that safeguarding heritage is not a, only about archiving history, but also about preserving the human connections that give it meaning, uh, because that's what the community is about, and that 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 is actually the spirit of the Wikimedia movement. That's that's it for me. Um, this was the last presentation uh, from from the working groups. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if if you guys online or here uh, regarding this work, this particular working group, and many many of you who are present here um, contributed significantly to um, to our findings. This, any questions, remarks? I, I just, uh, I'm not sure if this, like, the, the, okay, the, wait, the, I will give you this thing for the response. Uh, I, it's more of a, I don't know, remark or question or in between. But I, I just think it's interesting also if to hear if people in the room or online has any thoughts. But I think that's like what I what I started with in my presentation, the kind of um, the challenge of like making the work more um, not professional, but more like, yeah, well, let's say professional. I, and at the same time, like volunteer, is, is there like a conflict? Like, I mean, how do we keep motivation and engagement while still kind of trying to maybe guide and 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 uh, prioritize the the work? That's something that I've been thinking a lot in in, in the work of, uh, of of the like the, writing the paper and also in the working group. And would it would it be interesting to hear if there's any thoughts in the in the room? Like the I don't know the is it a conflict between kind of professionalizing the work and keeping maintaining motivation and engagement. Well, um, from my point of view, there's always a, a certain tension in that respect, but this tension is somehow a part of the Wikimedia movement as such, I would say, and it's not necessarily um, bad for, for the community spirit, because uh, this is a community of people who like to learn, and they also like to learn from each other. Um, and it's it, it's a knowledge-driven community. So um, 
the term experience is sometimes defined differently because you can be experienced in a certain field, for example, but you can be unexperienced as an editor or the other way, way around. But I feel that like both sides have respect for each other in, uh, in that term. But you guys might, might, might have a different um, experience in that term. Okay. Anyone? Um, anyone from the online audience? Maybe you would like to raise a question, not necessarily for me, but maybe for other uh, working groups. Okay. If there's no discussion at this point, I think we can move to um, to the final part of this session. Uh, presentation of general recommendations for the Heritage uh, Card Network, bigger project and, and, and discussion. Um, we did not prepare like a presentation for that part because uh, we felt that this is a sort of a workshop and we want to have a lively discussion and uh, have a room for uh, additional insights uh, after we have seen all the presentations from the working groups and the presentations of our keynote speakers. And so now, first of all, I will ask each uh, working group um, to give their final insights, like within uh, five minutes maximum, let's say. Um, like, what is your general reflection after seeing all of this today? Uh, also, the questions from the audience. Uh, what would be your one recommendation um, and, and, and maybe one extra conclusion that you did not uh, include so far. Um, so maybe I will invite you um, to... So we turn back... Uh, yeah. Join me, please. <laughs> so, so anyone can see you. As you wish, well, if you sit, if you stay here, you will not be. Okay, so we, we should go to the. Yeah, uh, let's join. Uh, <laughs> careful for the, for the wires. I'll take your chairs. That sounds good. Okay, so we're going to make a discuss an improvised discussion panel. <laughs> <laughs> take your chairs, guys, seriously. Sounds for five minutes. It's <laughs> Okay. Can they still see us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, yeah. 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 This, yeah. Is, then, then this is what people see. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we should, we should. So you can. You want to see? <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> <laughs> okay. And um. To, to, to everyone in the audience, uh, when we are thinking about this, this final part, we also decided that each of us is going to say about one thing where we either didn't find, uh, didn't answer or, or where we feel that we failed. Um, but uh, that's, that's up to you to, to decide about, about the final insights. But uh, maybe starting um, from Mehman, who was first to present. Um, <laughs> so. um, your, your, your final thoughts um, after seeing all the other presentations and additional insights that you would give now, right? Uh, well, my additional thoughts is that, okay, we all done our papers, uh, we conducted search, uh, now we know more about our works. Mm, like my recommendation will be is, uh, like uh, to work together, uh, like uh, and uh, draw the future strategy how do we we want to uh, go forward with our papers and what we can do uh, in next uh, like let's say months or years uh, to finish and uh, set the like uh, uh network uh, from this point uh, do I need to say where we failed? Like how? But you can. You yeah. don't have to. Maybe well, you didn't. I, I don't know. Maybe you know. Well, it's not well, a fail fast, but uh, I want. I just want the audience to have 
uh, you know, like a genuine. Well, I can idea. share from the legal working group where we failed. Uh, well, um, our like working group and our task is more specific. It's about the policy. It's about the copyright and etc. Of course, uh, legal terms, uh, legal things. It's uh, not easy for the like general audience or Wikipedians to understand. But um, uh, well, we'll try to humanize our uh, final paper and legal working group uh, to make it easy to read for non-legal people too. But uh, where we failed is that we can't find uh, uh, like partners uh, or ex experts from the uh, different institution in EU uh, to help us. Uh, thanks to Ariadna, at least she uh, uh, put her insights and feedback uh, and I'm still waiting more feedbacks from her. Uh, but we can't find uh, like uh, more experts in this area and especially in copyright area or uh, the people who work on freedom of panorama. Uh, maybe we will need to improve uh, like our outreach uh, to find the experts in legal terms. Okay, mm. thank you. Any comments on that? I had no works at European, I like the I don't know, European, yeah. European platform for cultural heritage, uh, I don't know, dissemination, maybe? Yeah, something, yeah, dissemination and also like improving the like, representation of the European culture mm -hmm. and digital. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Alessa? Okay, uh, I would say the time. Okay, I would say the time flies fast, and that's great that during this uh, year we had the possibility to uh, develop our four papers, which each of them gives, I guess, very different and very relevant perspective on different topics of preserving uh, natural and cultural heritage. Especially for me, that was really interesting to um, uh, to read and listen what like the actual for example volunteers what they are saying about their experience in photography and this topic um, as, as for me is really relevant and interesting to discover like maybe in a bigger project and i'm also curious what we can discover more like uh, in the future uh, regarding this topic um so I guess a lot of key insights should be like uh, from each working group should be gathered and um, like uh, as Mahman uh, told uh, to create some kind of strategy how to um, improve them and what we can do in the future. As about the failures, um, I'm not sure if it's failure I mentioned in the presentation, but that maybe was my personal ambition to reach out to um, bigger amount of institutions and have more uh, answers because I understand that um, a lot of institutions, organizations and experts, they have different perspectives and we can, if we can combine it to something one, uh, we could have even like more insights and more conclusions. Um, but like, as well as we understand that it's only the pilot project and we can do like everything uh, and to reach out to everyone, but I'm sure there is more um, tactics and strategies that can be implemented for the future and understand how to reach out to uh, more uh, people. But anyway, these experts that were involved and they gave very uh, useful insights, like um, I'm very thankful to them and we are very thankful to those experts that contributed and uh, express their um, willingness to help in the project and to contribute and uh, I hope we can continue our co collaboration as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Any comments, questions? Yeah, I also I, I had the same like experience that was really was difficult to find people that actually wanted to commit time like very few said that this is not interesting or this is like outside of the scope of my work, but the, like a lot of uh, like public institutions, for them there was too little time, like they needed much more time to uh, to prepare, which you can't do in a seed project. Like, I mean, it's a seed project, it's a, it's a, it's a smaller, small amount of time, so you need to be like flexible, but uh, how can I say it dramatically? Like some 
large state institutions are maybe not like the most always flexible organizations. So, so for them, it was like a lack of time. For smaller organizations, it was like a lack of finances, like they, they couldn't commit time without being remunerated, which is also like it's a seed project again. So it was very like difficult to um, uh, to um, get people like as part of the network in that way. And then, then something, if I'm just like continuing on, on the failure track, like <laughs> one, one thing that I was a bit surprised about was uh, the fact like of the cultural, cultural heritage institutions that I reached reach out to, everyone was ve very excited about the project. But I felt like less so in terms of like natural heritage and nature and biodiversity. I'm very, I'm very happy for Lyudmila's uh, like presentation and, and WWF Ukraine's involvement and also a few others. We also had like um, a conversation with uh, Richard Neville, the World's Boat Media UK, and also a lot of done, done a lot of work at the intersection between cultural and natural her heritage. And I think that was really interesting. But I felt like we have a much longer way to go when it comes to building partnerships and alliances with like biodiversity, natural heritage, protected nature organizations as compared to, I mean, this is like not the scientific, uh, like, uh, you know, conclusion in the paper, but based on the context that we have, or that I have had, or we have had in the working group, it's, it's, it was much easier to get motivation within the culture, like cultural heritage sphere than within the natural heritage sphere. Maybe I, I think you said it maybe yesterday, Natalia, we needed a better business case or something, but, but like for a, for a few organizations, like quite openly said, like why should we digitize nature? Like you know, this it's not like you know a museum which could get destroyed. And I was like, well, it is like exactly the same thing. You know, it's nature that gets destroyed by by war, by climate change, and and uh, so, so I, I got perplexed by the by the feedback, but realized that maybe maybe I don't know, um, maybe it's on us to actually develop a better. Uh, you call it a business case. Uh, I'm not really entirely sure what a business case is, but, but the better explanation of the or the project or, or something. A uh, business case. I, by saying business case, I meant uh, a narrative that immediately draws people to mm -hmm. a certain cause, mm -hmm. uh, like a sort of a call to action, but uh, a call to action that has data and proof mm -hmm. um, behind it. Mm -hmm. No, then, then uh, I think that's that could be what we need. Uh, make it easier for natural heritage or biodiversity organizations to understand, or like to, to, to get motivated, like by the by the cause. Uh, yeah, I I I I agree with those insights and. Um... Well, for, for for me, uh, there were two major discoveries uh, during during our work. Uh, like two two moments when I had um, sort of a discovery moment in in my head. Uh, first is realizing realizing um, that uh, this is not a project just about heritage. This is a project about Wikimedia movements as such, and the, this project like showed us our own limitations um, as a movement, not just. Uh, in the glam part, um, in the glam context. Um, so, so I really, I really think that uh, the outcomes and and, and the insights uh, can be representative for for um, for a movement as such. Uh, but I think I also think that uh, Wikimedia needs more of such projects. So I will reverse the narrative <laughs> and go from failure to the success because it helps to stop what I would call a growing inwardness of the movement. Uh, because I, I feel that's an issue. Uh, like uh, here in this project, we go outside. We, we, we invite external experts, institutions. Uh, we check our own limitations, but we also cross certain uh, mental barriers. Um, and and we, we zoom out, uh, we, we benchmark ourselves against modern technology, other initiatives. Uh, and even though, uh, even though sometimes uh, it's a painful uh, <laughs> benchmark, uh, still, this is a way to go outside of our bubble, let's say. 
Um, so, every, you know, like every failure can lead to success. That's something that is positive on the other end. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I think that's that's true, but I, like so, something that I like ahead because I, I think we all share the conviction that this is something that we would we would like to continue in one way uh, or another i don't want to speak for everyone else but i i felt that vibe kind of this is like not them but a, hopefully a beginning for for something else but that like now we have kind of uh, 60 pages something final paper just kind of you know all the insights and all the all the context and 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 so on um this a lot of things that could be done, but we can obviously not do everything. So now we have like been able to, as you said, Natalia, like zoom out and just try to kind of explore everything. And now we kind of try need to kind of direct our attention somewhere. It feels like there's several different approaches, like either where we are kind of almost there and perfect it, like you know, take you know, like uh, some some part where where the Wikimedia movement is, has actually quite Gone, come quite far and try to kind of you know use extra funding extra time to take it like the next step or like the foundational work where there are huge gaps like I, I think that both things like we could go both ways but maybe we couldn't we can't go both ways at the same at the same time yeah I, th I think uh, like, like to put it in a super simple way whatever we want to do as a movement or as a project team we cannot do it alone no, that's <laughs> uh, and, and and that's that's uh, also this also relates to any future if, if, if we want to have any future as as a movement. There's a there's an interesting question from Christian in the chat. Also, how can the results? Yeah. How can the results of the project get streamlined into the programs and work of others, such as the European Commission or the U European Heritage Hub? Yeah, where are your ideas in that? And I'm so asking others in the room or online. I think that's a very important, very important point. Uh, I, I think they should. I mean, that, that, I, I suppose that's my spontaneous answer. Like we, we have funding for a seed project from the Swedish Institute and we might apply for, you know, a, a, another one, but that's still like the, the Swedish Institute funding is kind of limited in the sense that it's about building, you know, uh, cross-country relationships across certain regions. In this case, like the Baltic Sea and we call it Baltic Sea and Central Baltic Sea and Eastern European neighborhood area. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's the formal term right. that they use. Uh, it, it comes automatically like uh, out of the mouth, um, but it, it's it's limited in in that sense. Uh, of course, all all funders are limited in, in, in different ways. Um, but I, I think it's it's definitely not on, the, on the list of things to do to check EU funding. Yeah, and um, uh, also relating to, to Christian's um, question, I believe that the outcome, that the report from the project can be used somehow to advocate the, the importance of, 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 of Wikimedia, yeah. because despite all the failures, <laughs> and limitations that we mentioned mm -hmm. uh, today still this is an enormous infrastructure uh, and there's so there's plenty of data there are plenty of possibilities um, so yeah, yeah taking in certain insights can be valuable uh, yeah. for for us in, in this um, bureaucratic mm -hmm. context i think what well, one thing that maybe i wish i yeah. the the tech Technology working group should have focused more on is like metrics, like in terms of the the reach. Because I think that one one of the very big advantages of the Wikimedia movement is that very few other platforms can compete with the same reach. Like when when material from from institutions are added to Wikipedia, like the reach that it can get, it's like it's you, you can't compare it with many other. Also because exactly. you can get data on it, like you it's it's difficult to get data from many different platforms where Wikipedia you can you can get data but we still know that that data is very limited um, there are tools that are being developed that, that break all the time there's like in you know frustration in Wikimedia communities around metrics uh, and I think that's that's an has been an important pull from cultural heritage institutions because they see that that can also motivate their their work the amount of millions of views and amount of level that they get through, through Wikipedia
one good thing okay. at the end is that oh, yeah is that uh, now we have like a full document uh, at, at the local level i can uh, show the example that when you are going to the some institution or uh, government and you are saying that we need like freedom of panorama we're just saying why you need freedom of panorama or what is it at least uh, when and then you are explaining that we need to upload the image of this building to the wikipedia to illustrate and etc but uh, it's just an argument from you and now we have like a uh, full paper uh, to show them uh, copyright part uh, risk part technology engagement and like full picture they're providing and that's also helpful Okay, so I just wanted to add to uh, what Eric had just mentioned, you know, that you mentioned that you have huge amount of data on Wikipedia. And I'd like to add that you, know, you also have huge amount of volunteers, which is um, a unique place to be, you know, in, in terms of uh, crowdsourcing, because you already have established set of volunteers who are interested in, in giving that data, working for uh, uh, for a number of hours uh, and, and are already motivated in, in doing so. So this is, uh, I think, one of the areas which is uh, fantastic to uh, to captivate on, basically. Um, in terms of European funding, I remember reading a call um, several years ago uh, about using technology uh, to protect heritage in Danza. Mm. And I'm sure that, you know, the European Com uh, Commission will give out calls on um, uh, on similar uh, areas. And I'm happy to keep looking at it, you know, just to, to find out, you know, if there may be uh, areas we could apply and, and grow this project together. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great insight. And you see, Christian, such an inspiring question. <laughs> and maybe this paper could be turned into a sort of a white paper. Yeah, <laughs> a foundation for, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Susanna, there is time at some point. So, is there a hand raised? Yeah, it's like it was. 15 minutes ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, Salma, if you want to say anything, then just raise your hand uh, hand again. I, I see there was another uh, comment about Sweden. I mean, it's it's a project with Sweden and Poland and Georgia and and uh, Ukraine. Uh, but I I think it's interesting to explore like the intersection as well, like between um, between our countries. Of course. Hi, Susanna. Ah, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I think I was clapping rather than uh, raising <laughs> a hand. <laughs> so, but it was uh, some time ago. And I was clapping at uh, Natalia's uh, comment about zooming out and seeing the bigger picture. And I, I would still like to clap. <laughs> sorry if I may. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other any other comments, questions? Okay, maybe maybe to 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 support uh, what what Mekhan said at the beginning. I also think we should continue yeah. because now that I have seen all those presentations, uh, even though I knew your, the drafts of your papers, like seeing it here. Witnessing it feels like we did a lot of work, and it would be a shame not to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, even though uh, right now we might be a little bit perplexed about um, what to focus on, mm -hmm. but I hope that with the help of our experts uh, and volunteers, uh, we will be able to determine mm -hmm. determine which way to go next. Yeah, the, the, I think the issue is not that there are no roads ahead. There's there are like, too many to choose. <laughs> there's like the roundabout of 500 different uh, exit points in, going around in circles trying to navigate. Yeah, also thanks to hubs, which involved in our project, like C hub and content. content uh, uh, and uh, we can use also the hubs platforms to like engage more affiliates in our region more volunteers uh maybe they need like help from us and we can provide or we need the help from them so we can use their uh let's say knowledge uh, resources yes i think that's a very important point uh because uh, we did mention uh, c hub and content partnerships hub several times uh but to to maybe to underline their uh, their influence on the project 
uh, they really do a great work in uh, in networking. Uh, they really helped us um, meet and uh, and brainstorm. Uh, and I think that's actually their role. They don't necessarily yeah. need to come up with uh, particular content, uh, but connect people within the movement, connect the dots, sort of. Um, mm. And and For yeah. Those who are looking who are non non Wikimedians, what 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 is a hub? Oh dear, we had a, we had a very long discussion for the past two years on that. Has the definition been uh, correctly? Okay, a hub, like, I mean, uh, the word hub is now uh, limited to Wikimedia. We all know also some kind of hubs. Uh, in our case, it's it's sort of an organization, rather informal than than formal. Uh, that supports other organizations uh, either, I don't know, by transferring certain type of know-how or logistics or just networking, uh, like an umbrella um, in, in, in case of CE Hub that refers to Central and Eastern Europe, of, of course. Um, it, it's a creature that defines itself continuously <laughs> and redefines itself. <laughs> But a very helpful creature. It's a good good explanation, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of something that I, I can't really wrap my head around. I'm, I'm going back to the kind of failure of involving uh, natural heritage organizations. But I think it's also interesting from like a platform perspective, like that at least I don't know if it's the same in in uh, in uh, like all involved countries, but in in Sweden, there's quite a lot of cultural heritage professionals that also engage on the platforms like either as staff time or also in many cases as, as volunteers because it's seen as like the go-to place to to work with uh, like if you want to reach out with with cultural heritage um, but we don't see the same like with with natural heritage like it, like in when it comes to Wikilove, Wikilove's Earth maybe especially we have like a lot of photographers that are really engaged and think this, this is a really nice way of getting like out, getting their photos uh, out uh, and there's also Wikimedians who think it's maybe a nice way of getting out of the basement or, uh, or something um, but there's very few like uh, nature like conservationists or bi biologists that engage actively in the in the competition and there's also like as we saw on the on the maps that I sh that I showed, there's very little data, very little observations, very little like information about species and sightings and observations on the Wikimedia platforms. So it's like that could point towards the fact that Wikimedia platforms are not seen as the go-to place for nature as it is for for culture. And I'm thinking, is it the lack in the technology? Is it the lack in the outreach in community building or like why why does why, why do cultural cultural heritage professionals want to engage with wikimedia platforms but not to the same extent nature conservation and i see both paki and tasha as Kasha, i was hoping you will uh, <laughs> say something on that uh, since you have PhD in science. Um, well, I don't know if that will help, but uh, that is a very interesting analogy, the kind of comparison of natural and cultural heritage to me. And it is also related, I think, to the earlier um, compromise that you mentioned, Eric, or the potential conflict between people's motivation and the technology that we provide for it. And I think it's linked to what Paki was saying and what Natalia was saying about uh, the kind of emotional link to cultural heritage, right? And then surely there is that kind of motivation for natural heritage as well, and it's strong. Mm -hmm. So for me, maybe our role is to be that kind of middle person that builds the technology with that in mind. And that is the kind of business case or the buy-in or the motivation of the volunteers in trying to find a way of showing them the link of not just pretty pictures, but also adding that data and the kind of um, benefits that come with that, with the conservational benefits. And that is for me almost like a nice steer of the way that that is what the technology should be providing. That's what the engagement could be providing as well. And 
just linking that and learning from the other analogy. Thank you. Uh, that was Kasia Markowska from Wikimedia. Oh, yeah, sorry. Our I Open Science me. Manager. Um, I just wanted to, um, you know, add to, uh, to what you were just saying. Um, I, I do see the importance of, uh, of documenting and preserving the natural heritage. And it, I am reminded of one of my Canadian colleagues who told me about the ice uh, wine culture in, in Canada, which is now in danger because of climate change. And there's a risk of this wine culture totally disappearing. And I see the importance of preserving this, you know, this information because it is already at risk. I wonder whether there is, um, there's an opportunity to create narratives to inspire uh, natural uh, heritage uh, uh, experts and professionals as well uh, in this, you know. So I know that heritage, uh, you know, cultural heritage uh, professionals are already, you know, motivated and they're doing this. But is there a way that you know we could build a narrative around the natural heritage, which is particularly the ones which are in danger, so that you know we could help them motivate. Uh, that, that, that's a very good point, and I, I, I also I, I think you're right that there's like also many things that are, are at the intersection of the cultural and the natural heritage. Like I mean, the ice wine in Canada didn't know, but I mean it's the same with champagne in France or whatever. Like they won't be able to do champagne in France like in, in a few decades because it's it's too warm. Um, in Sweden, there's a lot of discussion about like what, what do you call it, like, uh, eels, the the long mm -hmm. the long fish, mm -hmm. like in the, in the like, <laughs> but they are long. <laughs> what, what's the? <laughs> it's, it's a long, uh, yeah. slim fish. I don't know. It's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but because of the climate change and like the several reasons of which they don't know all of them, the eel is kind of very quickly diminishing in 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 uh, the amounts uh, and because of that it's also very very tough restrictions on fishing of eels mm -hmm. and that's a very like in certain parts of sweden that's like a culture a tradition that has been ongoing for you know centuries or i don't know a very long time uh, so in the sense like climate change and the diminishing the diminishing amount of, of of eels also kind of leads to this the potential extinction of this uh, of this like fishing culture so it's like it, it's very much interlinked right like if climate change impacts nature and nature impacts humans and humans impact culture or whatever um mm -hmm. and and yeah i don't know maybe that's like a we, we can use the intermediary like ice wine and eels to, to get this nature conservationist engaged i don't know but i it has been created much trickier, I think. Eels and hedgehogs. Have Eels a new and hedgehogs. For, <laughs> for our next project. <laughs> That's also a good name for a rock band. Eels and hedgehogs. <laughs> Two really cool animals. Um, I uh, so since we have a couple of minutes, also I think uh, I really love the. Uh, the sort, the kind of a checklist in Olesha's presentation uh, about potential risk for volunteers and the things that um, we should consider when, for example, giving instructions on how to do pictures for the contests, because those were kind of uh, things that actually we never thought of. Uh, and I'm also looking at Kasia, who was in charge of uh, Wikilabs monuments in Poland this year. Um, and it's a very fresh perspective, uh, taking care of all those uh, like physical even dangers, uh, because um, this is something that can happen to anyone. And um, I've heard <laughs> I heard stories of, of volunteers who were so eager to to photograph a certain uh, piece of heritage that they I don't know broke into somebody's <laughs> garden. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an anecdote. But the, the risks that you mentioned are, are, are like serious, um, serious things that this is a very tangible uh, result of this project because we can take those checklists, maybe develop them further and already include in the future contests. Uh, so so I, I, I must say this, this is super useful 
um, and, and, and I love the fact that you explored uh, this, it, like, I feel it was kind of a blind spot um, mm -hmm. so far for, for me, at least. Yeah, that was like really interesting to see uh, and read quite different stories from different volunteers because each of them faced um, same situations and the situations that you even like cannot think of that, that there is such a risk. Uh, so yeah, I, I can, I think it can be even like describe more details somewhere, maybe as an appendix to the um, final paper or something, uh, because this is like a really interesting topic. Um, and also about the conducting trainings for the volunteers. I don't know, maybe it was already uh, conducted somewhere or uh, um, some countries had this um, practice. But uh, for example, if you think that volunteer is already prepared uh, uh, before their photography session and can like not only uh, applauding for uh, comments and with the, for the photo contest, but just for their own security and for their own knowledge, if they will be already aware of all the risks that can happen and uh, all the security measures. Uh, so that will be very good. And, and yeah, probably we can even um, can think of develop uh, mm -hmm. something like that and maybe to um, include it as a, um, I don't know, um, some mm, some guidelines for the volunteers and include it to the uh, photo contest. Not rules, but maybe some criteria uh, and uh, they can recommendations. Yeah, recommendations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, like mm -hmm. a so tool, toolkit. toolkit. Yeah, so yeah. Right? Uh, Heritage Grant Network toolkit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's a great idea and and like there was a few uh, researchers that proposed that from like uh, professionalizing the photos mm -hmm. like uh, of cultural heritage uh, as well like the training programs for volunteers can be quite an efficient way of like uh, teaching volunteers or like informing volunteers about how, how like if, if you go to a church or a building or a whatever it might be like what should you actually take photos of what 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 this um what what are the important kind of angles and, and parts of the of the mm -hmm. monuments i mean there's a lot of knowledge around this uh, sure. and and we could gather that and also turn it into toolkits that would be useful for mm -hmm. for volunteers and also susanna mentioned uh, uh for sure it's the work not for the one person it's um the team, of course, the team is needed for mm. conducting such things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we have something to think about for the next 10 years at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I hope the Swedish Institute is prepared for, <laughs> for that <laughs> and you guys as well. Um, uh, Maybe maybe there are some final comments or questions. Um, I haven't I haven't heard uh, today from Yolanta, who was also a part of the project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was just wondering, maybe for the closing remarks, maybe we, you could you, you could tell us because actually joining Heritage Guard Network was also a kind of an onboard onboarding for you in the Wikimedia movement. So what was what is your like final conclusion since you worked um, communicating the whole narrative around the project so much? Uh, it wasn't maybe onboarding because it was after one year being there. <laughs> Here in the Wikimedia movement, but uh, it is still uh, first uh, my international project. Uh, I hope I helped <laughs> with my communication skills and expertise. I hope uh, it was interesting because um, thinking about communication. Uh, it was thinking about not only Polish audience, but also 
Swedish, Ukrainian and Georgian. So um, I thought about this project, how to communicate it uh, very simply using very, um, I don't know, um, simple communication with uh, good photos. <laughs> um, because everybody um, understands photos and when something is missing, it's easy to, uh, to be engaged because we were engagement group. And um, I think it worked with this uh, vanishing objects idea. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's still a good experience for me and for all of us. Thank you. Um, and final Kasha. remarks from Kasha, our open science manager. Thank you. Um, I also want. I wanted to say I'm. I'm really glad that I've joined the event uh, today because I kept hearing from Natalia bits and pieces about the project, but um, today really helped me understand the scope of it. And um, I was thinking similarly to you, Natalia, for example, about Olesia's uh, checklist around or um, tips around volunteers uh, going out into the world and taking pictures. When you hear it, it's so obvious. And similarly, with the things people could consider to uh, take um, to document, like the metadata to add or the legal aspects. And it's, I just think it's really great to take the time and organize the thoughts and organize the issues and put them in one place before jumping into something else. So for me, it was really helpful in that sense of bringing it all together. And um, even if things seem obvious, it's like, a really powerful starting point to to start something bigger or like a powerful tool to use for anything else thank you um, 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 thank you for all the comments um we'll finish this part now and uh we will have a 30 minute break and half past three we are going to meet for uh, a discussion panel and to those of you uh who uh, complain that you cannot see all the speakers. This time the discussion will be fully online. <laughs> so you will, you will see uh, the panelists uh, on, on Zoom. Uh, thank you once again, all the participants, all the speakers, all the experts here uh, with us in Warsaw. It's getting dark, actually. Um, and yeah, take, did they take, a, us? take a break and and uh let's meet half past three Are you hearing us yeah yeah uh, it's right that's why yeah. i hello can panelists hear me yes i hear you well i hope you hear me Great. too yes Okay, as we are waiting for Yulia, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she will join us soon. Uh, I'm here. Let me just, you're here? We cannot see you. Yes, we, you I'm adjusting my view, but I'm here and I can hear you well. Okay, great. Yes, because uh, unless you turn on your camera, we will not see you on the main screen. Okay. Hi. Hi, Olivia. Okay. More and more people are coming, but uh, we should begin according to the agenda. And just to remind you, we have one hour uh, for our panel discussion. And I want to thank uh, all of our experts that are here ready to talk to us. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I don't know if you've been listening to the whole uh discussion so far but we have been presenting uh our uh main insights from uh working group final papers uh afterwards we had some discussion we talked about our successes and the failures within the project um and for for other guests let me let me introduce everyone um okay i i have read your all of your bios they are absolutely amazing and exactly because of that i will not try to repeat them uh, so if you could please briefly introduce yourself so, so that i don't omit uh something important uh maybe starting from uh julia um please tell us 
uh, a little bit about yourself. I don't remember what I wrote in the bio, but uh, maybe that's uh, the best, so I'll be more uh, efficient here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you all. Uh, my name is Julia Maria Koszewska, and I represent Wikimedia uh, Polska here, uh, where I serve as uh, vice president. In uh, my other capacities, I have... Uh, I have studied different subjects, but this includes uh, sociology on a PhD level, uh, which I gained uh, studying uh, exactly heritage and uh, its influence, um, especially in the context of historical museums, its influence on uh, collective identity, uh, collective memory and national identity for education. Besides, I have been um, involved in the GLAM sector, both professionally and in the uh, wiki world, uh, merging the two uh, and uh, since the beginnings of the wiki GLAM projects in Poland. I guess that's this is the shorter version. I think that's definitely the shorter version. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, short or long version? Well, let's keep it short as well. Uh, I'm David Hermanson. I'm the associate professor of history, and I'm chief of museum at the chief uh, the museum and archive institution of Shivik. Uh, I have conducted several research projects internationally, nationally, locally, and uh, our museum and archive organization world, works worldwide with 30 countries uh, across the world. Uh, special topics, uh, cultural research, uh, social resilience projects, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian. Hello, my name is uh, Christian Humburg. I'm the um, executive director of Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, but uh, I, I don't have a clear history of heritage or heritage management, rather with the question of transparency, documentation and accountability. Uh, I founded many years ago the German uh, portal together with others, Frag den Staat, ask the governments for FOI requests. Uh, also built up Corrective, it's an investigative non-profit newsroom in Germany who uh, even became a uh, European-wide attention for an investigation earlier this year that the German party AfD wants to re-migrate people and also, and I think I want to mention that specifically today in investigation many years ago when I was still there into who shot down MH17 over Ukraine and uh, so the investigations done by um, uh, Corrective are also often visualized uh, and supported with data points and documenting uh, what was uh, happening. So I hope that I can uh, bring some additional value from that angle other than my Wikimedia role. Thank you very much. Um, for, for, for the past several hours, uh, together with uh, project team, um, our online participants and experts that are here in Warsaw with us, uh, we've been trying to figure out if uh, the Heritage Guard Network project made any sense uh, to people outside of Wikimedia. Uh, and we, we were one, with our last discussion, we, we were trying to sort of do a kind of a self-assessment in where we have been more successful and where have we failed the most in, in the project? And I just would like to know your perspective uh, because um, we, we have shared the drafts of our final papers with you uh, beforehand. Um, the drafts will be surely uh, adjusted after this event with, with some minor edits. Uh, but I, I, I just would like to know uh, that it all makes sense to you and what was uh, like the highest point and um, where, which questions did we did not manage to, to, to answer according to you? Uh, maybe some questions that were important uh, from your perspective. Um, maybe uh, the other way around, uh, starting from Christian this time. Yeah, thank you. It was a, a great pleasure not only to listen to the results, to also read the four final papers of the four uh, working groups. Um, from my perspective, there were two working groups where I found discussions and debates that uh, I have seen and read a little bit more before that was on community and engagement. That was the one paper and also the paper on 
uh, the technology, because these are, I think, debates that we often have at the Wikimedia movement. Um, uh, but I don't want to say that I didn't see that as all as being too inward. Uh, specifically, the paper on technology also enjoyed that it had really um, a really new aspects, and I also liked how much it made the case for uh, Wikidata and described the potential that we have with Wikidata. The other two uh, papers I felt really went a little bit um, beyond what I had uh, uh, read so far, the legal paper, and I know that there are not many people who, t who even know about Panorama of Freedom. Like when I speak with people, people don't know about Panorama of Freedom because it's such a specific legal question. So I think it's a lot of added value just to have already an overview about the very different landscape um, in Europe. Um, so I think that was really helpful. And also I think the risk uh, paper was something I hadn't also thought of before, but I think that has also to do with the situation. And when I look from my perspective in Germany, uh, that uh, many of the risks described there are risks that uh, volunteer photographers that we have usually uh, don't have. The one thing I would like to add to the risk paper and then um, I would like to end from my side is uh, that um, we also have to sometimes see if open data can also be uh, misused. For example, um, biodiversity data, there's a danger that uh, that data can be exploited and that we even kind of risk biodiversity to, by being open. We also saw we have cobblestones in Germany. It's kind of a heritage to remember where people have lived that were uh, killed in concentration camps. And we have unfortunately also seen that uh, this open data has been used by right-wing activists to, um, to attack these cobblestones in Germany. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but I think it's still important to also think about these risks and then make a very good judgment what data should be uh, open and not. And with that, uh, I would leave it. And thank you that I was the first one who could speak because that's obviously the easiest because I could now refer to all four papers. Thank you, Christian. That's a very valid um, point that you mentioned here. And I think uh, there's a great chance that uh, the risk working group will be able to uh, perhaps add some of the insights still in, into, into the final report. Uh, David. Thank you. Uh, well, I've listened to uh, all day's conversations and dialogues, and I, I dare say, first of all, I'm not too surprised that the natural heritage was the most difficult to uh, to find volunteers, uh, well, not volunteers perhaps, but but the institutions uh, willing to um, to participate. Um, I think we have a common sense, at least in the Western world, that um, the nature is always there, even though we have all these storms and floodings and, well, everything. Uh, I still think we have a, a um, thought that nature is always there. So that's a great point of view. And as I'm responsible for being the philosopher who pulls the emergency brakes, <laughs> uh, as I've been writing the report that's critic to, to um, the digitization, not the digitalization of cultural and nat natural heritages. Um, as the problem is not that we digitalize uh, thus preserves um, and are able to afterwards, if, if something is destroyed, even rebuild something. So that's not the problem. The problem is sharing where cultural and natural sites can be involved in risks not being preserved. Uh, as previously mentioned, the biospheres and um, biotopics, etc., but also the cultural uh, heritage that we are all here to preserve and love for future generations to come. So that's quite interesting and, and important topics to, to continue discussing. And also, I think the copyright issues, as 
we have artists that would like to have some income from their doings. So copyright is there to protect their rights. So that's my point of view. Thank you. Uh, you can't see it, but I do. Uh, all of the people here in Warsaw are, are taking notes while you guys are speaking. Um, so it's very valuable, I'm sure. Um, and now we have Julia. Uh, thank you. I, it is quite challenging to say what is missing because so many things are covered. And yet again, there's also recommendation to do exact proper mapping for the next years. So this already covers what is missing, <laughs> I would assume. But uh, if, uh, if I was to add a few points, um, my personal perspective on many things and like my personal personal preference uh, prefer, preferred take is uh, always to link in between the different things so here although it's uh, on one hand uh, the recommendations are very uh, practical i would suggest to maybe mix a few things like for example in the uh, in the engagement of the communities uh, we have recommendation about uh, one of among uh, many other things we have emotional engagement and then in other elements we have uh, preservation of um, uh, of different uh, like from other perspectives so merging those two i would uh, i propose uh, maybe uh, approaching also the communities uh, that have that already have very strong uh, emotional take uh, for example indigenous communities in some regions they have a very particular view very detailed uh, perspective um, sometimes uh, pretty much enriching to the knowledge of outsiders uh, but they also already have <laughs> mapped for generations the different uh, changes uh, ongoing, uh, the risks as well, but they, they are also a potential group of volunteers. And with this exchange of uh, between the already Wikimedia uh, involved uh, people and the, uh, the communities, uh, community members that are not yet involved, we, we might also need to see because some of them are <laughs> and some of them are doing really great job in this regard. So there to also in as part of the mapping exercise, I would suggest to seek for the potential um, of already existing uh, things, including on other um, uh, aspect that could be also uh, while mapping our communities of already seasoned <laughs> Wikimedians, because among our communities, we do have also people with very precise expertise and sometimes official function as well. Uh, so that could be useful uh, exercise. So maybe at this moment I'll, I'll step on this. <laughs> I guess uh, um, more things would come in for the discussion, but uh, I want to thank and congratulate uh, the groups and uh, the group leaders because uh, quite a lot of the recommendations are <laughs> is done, but a lot of all those recommendations are fully valid and. Uh, it is a challenging position to to say what is missing. Thank you. Well, thank you. The, the group leaders seem happy <laughs> with your comments and and uh, definitely hungry for more uh, of the review. Um, well, one of the one of the reasons why we organized this final event uh, is because we want to we want other people um, to help us define how can we uh, continue this project. Well, first of all, should we? Uh, should we? Because, uh, as you know, there is a perspective of uh, getting another grant for a freer uh, project and like building uh, the Heritage Guard Network in a more expansive way. Uh, so should we? Uh, and then I think the biggest problem for um, for us as group leaders, since now we have so much data, so much information, uh, is to determine what should be the first next steps. And I'm, I'm I'm very curious of uh, of uh, of your approach. So according to you, uh, what would be like the most tangible um, first step if we should continue? Unless you think that uh, this is not uh, a project that um, 
should be continued in this particular uh, form. Like if you if you were to design the heritage guard network, uh, which per perhaps we will be able to to do, where where would you start and and how how would you build on what we have already uh, discovered, uh, David? That's a very complex question, I dare say. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's an important project uh, that you have been doing. The pilot studies you have been doing, they're quite important because they reveal several issues that we have to take under consideration. As for instance, the different copyright legislations within Europe and within the world, etc. Uh, but also then the risks of people not being paid for what they do, what they have been doing, uh, the risks of, of um, disnification, the risks of, of indigenous peoples being left out by disnification, etc. So there are very many great issues to solve. And also the other risks of, of uh, damage to cultural heritage sites or natural heritage sites. Those things are due to be more researched about, as I think. Uh, but that's my very personal point of view. And I understand, as I said, I'm the, the crazy philosopher who, who pulls the emergency brakes uh, in this forum. But still, I think those questions are important. Um, and to continue a pro project like this, uh, I think also you said something within one of the seminars that uh, giving toolkits for volunteers that are out photographing, uh, perhaps that's a good start. Um, and then, there is also the sharing rules of what they find. We're back in that problem again, but still some guidelines and uh, do's and don'ts. In Sweden, we have the so-called Allemansretten, the uh, right to each and everyone to almost be everywhere, anywhere, and to take walks and uh, use nature and it's it's not a problem when 98% of people who use the Allemansretten in Sweden use it with respect for nature, but the 2% that don't, that's a problem. And uh, there is also a misunderstanding of what this right to use common grounds actually means. Um, and people say, this is Allemansretten. I'm allowed to be here, but still there are landowners' rights, in, for instance, uh, that are not being respected. Many cultural and natural sites are on private land, and as the Allemansretten in Sweden allows people to go there, um, the landowners say, well, if you pay for being here, then we can protect and preserve these cultural and natural sites, but still that's not allowed by the Allemansretten. You're not allowed to take fees for doing so. So there are great many problems to solve within going further. And I think uh, one should consider these things one or two or three times within perhaps a uh, upcoming project. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Julia. Uh, thank you. I would definitely stop uh, and celebrate <laughs> if I was uh, more involved in this project, uh, even more than this celebration now, uh, because uh, the team teams achieved really so much and really a lot is done. So I will congratulate you again. <laughs> Uh, but for the step, uh, steps to take further, I, I think that what could be useful could be uh, first uh, brainstorming on the direction uh, where to go, because already from this uh, 
exercise. This is really an understatement, <laughs> but uh, it is very clear that there is a huge potential. Uh, even just the, the suggestion to, to do the mapping, <laughs> this is not <laughs> a simple exercise. This is uh, this could be already the product for the next three years. So this is one of the options. Another options that I could see is, for example, to consider whether this um, network is to be more as uh, in a product perspective or rather a network of uh, experts in, in their fields uh, and in this regard uh, more like a permanent uh, network uh, of collaboration so short-term long-term uh, perspectives on both ways they, there could be also a question how much this is to be um, more insight in the wiki media movement and wiki projects or how much this is to be open for collaborations with the outside world uh, and then also part of this could be uh, a question for example uh, about the impact of the actions is the impact to be on the communities on the movement not exclusive of course uh, is it the impact, of course, on the heritage, uh, but uh, can the impact can be, for example, also on the advocacy level, so creating permanent politics to uh, to be involved in this aspect of protecting heritage. Uh, so, um, so there are the, all those different uh, paths that the project can go, and uh, even excluding one doesn't necessarily mean that in the next phase <laughs> it can take another but uh, there's definitely a huge potential here and uh, yeah so uh, and then also even for example about the advocacies and all these aspects um, one of the steps uh, like very particular for example David mentioned what is also in the recommendations the, the toolkits so the toolkits could be also that's another aspect to map already existing <laughs> toolkits uh, but um, there could be also uh, a special toolkit about the security or potential risks for the people involved because uh, of course there's a human factor so from most of you this is uh, most of us this is on the top of other professional involvement but uh, there are also other aspects that uh, especially in some um endangered uh, areas um for the like well related but also natural heritage disasters or sometimes both uh there are certain uh situations that uh, people that are involved could be in risk uh, put at risk so also to consider this kind of uh, uh, aspects so they're also our heritage <laughs> so they also need to be protected uh, so all those different aspects, uh, definitely please do continue, please don't stop, uh, but th there's so much uh, that could be done, <laughs> so now let's pause and celebrate your success, but uh, then there's th so many ways that this project could take forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian. Yeah, let me uh, cluster maybe my answer in three steps. I think first of all, my first advice would be, and that's a very practical one, but you probably have thought of it. I think it's necessary to document really all the results in a in a in a website. That's not a uh, that's not a wiki. Uh, that's the fundraising reality. But I think a nice slick website it doesn't have to be fancy, but where you can uh, quickly read what the results are, where you can see the bulk of reading, and where you can also see the people who are involved because I think that is then the website and the address uh, which can allow you to to get further funding. Uh, but you probably have thought of that already. My second question is, um, and I think uh, that is in line of what I asked earlier already, how is it possible to kind of mainstream these ideas and these projects into activities by others who are already similar? Because I think it's sometimes for innovation very important that you start yourself, but there has to be one point where you have to kind of get out of your own shoes and to be able to get bigger. Um, for example, um, the, uh, the European Heritage Hub is financed by the EU for two years that ends next year. I don't know if you're in contact with them, but maybe partnering with them and having the specific guard and uh, heritage defending aspect uh, in there could be like the USP of this network and the bigger
picture of um, of European Heritage Hub. But on the other hand, to me, uh, when we look specifically on this guard perspective, uh, that is a global phenomenon where you only thought about Europe so far. So at the same time, one could also think global. One could think about the UNESCO, knowing that the UNESCO has absolutely no funds, but things that the UNESCO finds interesting, again, are then also there's a higher chance that international foundation find it uh, interesting and also international foundation find it extremely interesting when they find coalitions and not just like one organization um, applying for money. Um, and I think I, I think it's a really, really interesting um, thought of having like a global heritage defender network, right? And people can can be, maybe that's too militaristic, but really like the soldiers of our heritage uh, so that people really want to join and be part of that. And therefore, the question that Julia asked, should it be like more towards Wikimedia or to the outside world? I would always say it should be more to the outside world. And then I think many Wikimedians will be part of it too, uh, but it should be bigger than that. And the last uh, third point is maybe on um, um, on the content side at uh, Wikimedia Deutschland. We have we used to look at communities and institutions, and we always l looked at these two levels. And then at some point, we found out that that is not differentiated enough for our real work, because the most interesting people are usually the weak, the people who are in the institutions, but not often on the top of institutions, of course, with the exception of David, but um, uh, people who, do, who, who are not necessarily the one who can decide on the budget of the institutions, but have, have an incredible internal motivation for heritage protection. And we find that these people are often the most interesting people to really create change, because sometimes it doesn't help you if you have the executive director, you had a dinner and he says, yes or she, we do it. But then, until a, such a such an organization gets going, it takes way longer than if you start with the people in the organization. And we call that um, the uh, community of practice. So we work with three people. We work with the Wikimedia community, the community of practice. These are the people who sometimes even do that in their free time because they really love their job, because they really feel that it's important what they're doing. And the third level is then also the institutions who are willing to give their logos, maybe a little bit of budget, maybe de decisions, maybe connections to the political uh, sector. That on the issue, um, on the on the content side, and the other one I think is that we also have to think how we manage that these institutions in their efforts break out of their data and IT silos. So that, you know, that, that heritage institutions use a common infrastructure that can be linked, that can be connected um, and I think we can play a major role there that's always hard for an institution to do that on their own because often you have in a good sense competing institution the first one who makes a move then the other second one is like then I do it differently so sometimes you need an outside player who can have this convening role to uh, to really bring um, uh, uh, new ideas of how we can structure data and in IT infrastructure to really connect it on a European level. And I think that's so incredibly important because with the AI systems and the AI is being trained so much now on the on the content, we have to make sure that what we think is good content from Europe is also part of the training. And that is not the case if it's not digitalized, if it's not accessible. And then the new AI world will be without all the knowledge of what we have collected in our heritage institutions all across Europe. Thank you for all these vital points. Uh, I think some time ago, uh, we arrived at a point where we thought we have explored so much, but listening to you turns out that there are still uh, things we haven't figured out. And if this was an interview for the new Heritage Guard Network, I'd say you are all in. Um, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to keep this only for myself. And uh, I would like to give opportunity to my colleagues here uh, from other working groups to ask questions uh, as well. Guys, who would like to, who would like to start? Okay, the mic. Uh, if, if, if you are... 
If, if, if you join the Zoom conversation and you turn on your camera, they will see you. You don't have to, oh. j just don't unmute yourself. Yeah, look, hey everyone. Um, no, I, I think it was a very interesting uh, conversation, uh, conversation and I agree with Natalia that it's like, um, I, I felt like my brain was exploding like before a coffee break and I was just getting uh, bigger and bigger. Um, I, but, but I do think at the same time like the, the, that the conversation kind of continues to to dig into the, the tensions that we still have like been discussing also throughout the project. How do we kind of maintain uh, motivation while getting like more professional at what we're doing? How do we ensure that we kind of balance the the risks of being open with the with the with the advantages of of being open? Uh, like what well, I, I think from my perspective that you know this information. Could be used by uh, like by bad faith actors anyway. Um, but like informing people about uh, heritage is also a way of like creating interest and making people passionate about the the their local communities or the local contexts or other contexts that they might not have been aware about on beforehand. But I I appreciate David's what what, what did you say like uh, philosophic handbrake or 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 something because I, I think it is important and I know like the the open knowledge communities are very much you know already thinking about like how do we think about open access in relation to indigenous communities how do we do that in in a respectful way not like coming and stealing uh stealing information but rather you know collaborating with communities to to give agency like so, something that we did in in Sweden just recently was started to collaborate with biosphere reserves which is like not really protected nature but but like it's about human humans and nature and found that there's a lot of you know this the biosphere reserves often have like local communities that are really passionate about sharing information about their their region their history their knowledge their culture their uh, agriculture their beehives or, or whatever it might be um so I, I feel like I'm just mumbling along, but I I I, uh, I definitely you know uh, think that a lot of the things that you have been discussing are like continuing what we have already you know considered, but taking it one kind of step at and zooming out maybe a bit even more, which I really appreciate. Um, I I still feel like it's it's so potentially big. There are so many you know different ways that I I still struggle a bit with kind of seeing what, what would be the most value. I think it was Christian maybe that said like also the value for, for whom, like who should we do the project for? Is it for like Wikimedians for the outside world? And I honestly don't know, but maybe that's the that's the situation you're in also when you have worked on a project for like one year and you have like 60 pages in a paper and you need to get a few weeks afterwards to, re to reflect. I don't know, Alessia or Mehman, do you have any like, Questions, thoughts, or <laughs> or thoughts. But one question, maybe to to like uh, whoever feels um, motivated to to reply. But was there like um, something specifically like that kind of uh, caught your attention? Like this would be a great project in itself. If there's like one one certain uh, like we start writing the application tomorrow and you feel like this is what we this is what we should go at i can go it's okay in uh, in the recommendations from the groups it it was clearly stated uh, that the situation in ukraine is uh, in a way um with many demands uh, for the protection of the heritage, but also uh, could be used as uh, exemplary in the, in some regards uh, about the practices. And so 
Ukraine has always been very hard, so some might be not uh, surprised. But for me, that was uh, one of the elements that uh, there are already several uh, institutions, even uh, from the Ukraine, from Ukraine, but also from uh, other countries uh, involved in the protection of the heritage. Ukraine itself is doing uh, a lot, both on governmental and non-governmental level, for the protection of the material cultural heritage but also natural heritage and uh, other aspects um and i think that, that there's a lot of risks uh to, to be mapped uh so i think that uh, uh that was for me that was something that it's really resonated uh, in my heart and my mind and and I think that this is something that uh, maybe could be considered as that could be as one of the top projects. I'm not saying that uh, we should now all go to Ukraine and <laughs> save our, our colleagues from Ukraine. No, you, you, they, I'm looking at some of, uh, of you here at the screen. I guess some are also in the room. You have great experience in doing it. And maybe this is something that could be used as kind of uh, case um, uh, for, for studying uh, certain practices, but also seeking uh, the needs and potential. Uh, so that could be one um, particular aspects that uh, for me, that that was something. Uh, freedom of panorama is also or and has been a challenge um, in Ukraine for many years. So Yes, uh, if you ask for one specific project that resonated, potential product, that's uh, that would be the one for me. But maybe also just to say that there was also in this community engagement about this emotional engagement. I think so many of us uh, are, some because you are from Ukraine, some others because uh, we uh, emotionally resonate with this. We are emotionally involved already. And uh, I have in mind uh, that one particular example that uh, it was 2018 uh, when the big fire des um, destroyed the, the National Museum uh, of Brazil in Rio. And so the Wikimedia community, so, and including uh, different artifacts uh, that were stored there, so not just the building, the, the damage was really. Um, extensive and the response of the wikimedia movement was to collect the photography of uh, photo documentation or even not a professional photo documentation but basically photographies of uh, of all the artifacts and the building so as cultural material cultural heritage of uh, uh, of brazil and to provide this to the museum and the brazilian community so that was something that people reacted responded with emotional engagement, we imagined what that could mean to lose so much of uh, of national heritage. Uh, but that was also something people started reacting uh, with, like, "Oh, I've been there for in summertime. <laughs> I don't know, maybe European winter." Uh, but uh, I, I would assume that that sparked different memories and emotional engagement and uh, and people reacted so I, I fully resonate also with this aspect of uh, that emotional engagement is uh, is a really strong factor and this is something also to to build on and the narratives could create it as stated in the recommendations thank you thank you David Yes, I was actually thinking of one other immediate project that could be addressed. Last week, I attended a large conference on the Baltic Sea and our problems within the Baltic Sea in Visby, Gotland, and we were some, some 650, 660 delegates from all over uh, the Baltic Sea. Uh, all the eight countries. And one of the questions we addressed was uh, the resilience on energy that we know that uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war, etc., affects us all. We also know that uh, the transition to the, the new world uh, with a sustainable future 
means that we have to revise our energy flows from fossil fuels, etc., to more environmental friendly. Uh, and all the experts said the technology is available. We can tomorrow provide all of this. And that's what I'm coming to. We can provide the technology, but who owns the data we collect? So that would be my address to you as a, an open database like Wikimedia or anything else. Who owns the data we collect? Should it be a bilateral deal between countries, uh, multilateral, that is, then? Should it be, uh, well, who owns the data we collect for the future? So, and I see in the chat a public domain. Yes, but who owns the public domain? So, mm -hmm. still. Who owns the data we collect? And that applies to both the questions about the security of the cultural and natural heritage, but also the questions of copyright issues, etc. So that would be my address to you. Concern about who owns the data. Thank you, David. Uh... Christian mentioned uh, that we should have a landing page. So maybe we can call it whoownsthedata.org to make it more interesting. Uh, I'm just... <laughs> copyright be, goes uh, to you. If, if I may ask that question, and then now we are in a real panel discussion, but I would think that all the data should be kind of brought into the public domain under CC0 and have, for example, on a Wikimedia project, and why would then the question of who owns it be so relevant? That would be my question to David, because then it would belong to all of us. Ultimately, there is still someone who uh, owns these databases, even if it's a public domain, someone is controlling it. Who? Okay, okay, got it. I would say Wikimedia. Yeah, and who owns <laughs> Wikimedia? Yeah. So that's, oh, that's so I think it's a very important question. Putting on the camera, but now I, I'm just uh, thinking about that. But I think one of the strengths of the Wikimedia movement is that everyone owns it in a sense. All the, I mean, like pr from from a purely legal point of view. The, the things that are added are owned by everyone who contributes. So that's like, I suppose, on, on English Wikipedia, let's say that I don't know how many hundred thousand of people have edited Wikipedia. All of those kind of own the content on the Wikipedia, uh, on, on English Wikipedia. So it's like the, the, the advantage of a crowdsourcing project is that it kind of diminishes the risks of someone owning the data or controlling the data because it's kind of collaboratively, uh, collaboratively owned. But I, I think it's an interesting interesting question, but I think it also could be kind of turned into the advantage of, of working with a, with, with a project that involves hundreds of thousands of volunteers or owners rather than, you know, something that is controlled by one large multinational company or like one, uh, I don't know, one um, large I don't know, service provider of, of some sort. Uh, also when it comes to like transparency and being open with the, with the data, this is my spontaneous you. Any other comments on that? Okay, we have 13 minutes left and I wanted to change the atmosphere a little bit and since we are talking about emotional engagement, uh, a personal question to, to, to all of you and but if anyone else wants to answer, uh, I think it would be interesting to hear like what is the one piece, one uh, example of national or cultural heritage that you are personally attached to? Like imagining that it would gone would really make you uh, frustrated. You can have some time 
to think. Maybe I, I can story because uh, okay, uh, Christian, please go. I, I live in a very small town north of Berlin, Bernau. I'm sure no one of you knows, and no one of you knows that Bernau is a UNESCO town because of Bauhaus, but we have one really big Bauhaus building here that was built between 1928 and 1930. It's just close to my house. And just two weeks ago, I had a, a guided tour through this old building where also the uh, architect who later built the white city in uh, Tel Aviv was a pupil. And that's the building where I would be, <laughs> I can't believe that the Maya Witwa Bau wouldn't be there anymore. I, I feel the emotional load <laughs> while you're speaking. Um, Yulia, you wanted to, to mention. Well, um, I have never been there, but I definitely heard about it <laughs> and the people behind. <laughs> so, but uh, for me, the first thing, I'm definitely a foodie. So for me, uh, cultural uh, heritage in culinary cultural heritage, including material as recipes, but also the practice, all the elements of uh, culinary uh, instruments, so to say. This is definitely, um, for me, one thing that I would not be able even literally to live without. And uh, I have several particular favorite cuisines, but uh, that's also something that I love exploring. There's a space for that on Wiki. Maybe not that very active, but there are, on one hand, there are articles about in on Wikipedia um, about different specific um, dishes. Um, there are also wars about it. Uh, who who owns um, Klitevsky or who invented hummus and these kind of things? There are even media wars about it. We recently had about Hodnik on New York Times and. Um, Lithuanians responded with diplomatic response on social media. Uh, but um, these are all, we also have special wiki books uh, with recipes. Um, and so this is something that's interlinked with the basic human needs, <laughs> cultural heritage, and wiki projects as well. I, I love that and um, begin to be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> as you speak. Um, anyone else wants to share their favorite natural or cultural heritage? Someone in the room? Oh, maybe. Oh, Susanna. Susanna is. Yeah, I might. I might. I, I, I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm an, uh, you know, not in the panel. So, anyway. I, I would like to chime in with this Baltic Sea thing. Um, uh, Baltic Sea is a is deteriorated every every summer. It the blue algae that uh, takes over the whole uh, sea is uh, sort of making um, like transforming completely the way in which uh, the sea is used. And I'm 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 terrified at seeing it happen, and I'm thinking constantly that I'd love to stay at the the sea, but it is <laughs> not uh, uh, mm, comfortable anymore. Uh, and uh, well, I can also relate that to several other places. You know, the way in which the the change in the climate takes over the um, cultural environment uh, effects, deteriorates. Oh, well. Oh. <laughs> I think Yumila wanted to. Yeah, uh, my favorite um, natural uh, heritage yeah. site is um, the, uh, it's called Karmelikova Podilia. It's na uh, national park. Uh, it's you, know, maybe you can turn on your camera. Um, I, oh, you're not in the. the yeah, in the, okay. Be, right. Maybe I can. Um, so, uh, okay. and it's. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, in uh, central Ukraine, uh, uh, it's all old growth oak forest, very beautiful area. And it's called like Podila, is 
the region in center of Ukraine and uh, name also after uh, Ustim Karmeluk. Uh, he was like a local Robin Hood and he was imprisoned uh, in uh, this uh, uh, in Olihopil, it's city near this um, where uh, this area is located. Now it's two communities, Chichilnik and Olihopil, uh, after administrative reform. And uh, this uh, national park is situated in these two communities. Thank you. It's fascinating to observe how your facial expressions uh, change when you talk about these things. Uh, Yulia, you were first to raise the hand as far as far as I remember, and then Christian. Thank you. Uh, just one particular uh, idea that that could be hopefully also long term um, effects, at least. That uh, protecting of natural heritage uh, also starts with everything, small things that we do. So one of the uh, ideas uh, to share what the Heritage Card Network could uh, either do by itself or encourage others to do is to basically implement, or implement create uh, uh, eco-friendly policies for organizing Wikimedia events, like not, or, not using plastic, this kind of things, uh, how to run the office in the eco-friendly way. I'm sure that such practices are also existent across the movement, uh, so collecting them, that could be also one of the ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Christian. Oh, we cannot hear you. You are muted. Sorry, I took down my hand and I thought that was it. Uh, no, um, before we come to the end of the session, I would really like to like kind of mention two political initiatives that are in connection of what we are talking about. And the one is, I think we haven't spoken about that, the Creative Commons, that they have the Taruch Coalition for Open Access to Cultural Heritage, and I'm posting that because I feel that that initiative by CC corresponds with a lot of debates we had today. And the second is the um, knowledge, um, the Digital Knowledge Act that Comunia uh, suggests that the European Union should adopt. And um, maybe you all are aware of these two initiatives that I'm sorry that I'm taking time, but I just wanted to make sure that there's a link because I think both of them are relevant. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you for the links. Uh, we, we we are um, we are noting ev every link and important information in the chat, ju ju just so you know. And this discussion will be available uh, later on on YouTube. Um, I was also I was thinking uh, during this project, and and Yulia actually made me realize that uh, it almost happened once. Uh, can we uh, consider Wikimedia uh, heritage? Uh, I know there's been attempt to to make it part of the UNESCO uh, official list, um, and that's one of my takeaways from 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 the project that I started to see Wikipedia and and its uh, sibling projects as uh, a part of the world heritage as well itself. I think it also goes uh, in a way in line with what uh, David mentions about the ownership. Uh, it's, uh, for example, if we look at the International Bank of uh, Seeds of uh, all plants possible, they have two locations. And one of them is on the so-called neutral grounds, uh, grounds on Svalbard, so the international territory. Uh, when if we consider Wikipedia or Wiki projects as cultural heritage, because it is culture and also it's like a sum of human knowledge, at least attempts to collect it. Uh, maybe we should also have alternative uh, locations uh, for servers, because at this moment, uh, it, when it comes to ownership, indeed, we all co-owned the, the data, we all contribute and also can use it. But then if the servers are down <laughs> or if there's one decisive person at the end of all this chain that would at some point, I'm not saying the person now, <laughs> but uh, in theory, uh, maybe person in the future would decide to close it down, then we might have owned the data, but where is it? Um, so, with, with all those things, the, the 
to change to switch the, the, the to change the paradigm of thinking about uh, Wikipedia, but also Wikimedia projects in general, and ourselves as contributors. Um, I think if we think of ourselves also as uh, um, creative people in the cultural uh, context uh, for contributing to Wikipedia, that, that's also a different uh, perspective. And but most of all about the uh, the effects of our work. There was indeed an attempt uh, uh, to for rec UNESCO recognition of uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the attempt was initiated by a Wikimedia uh, team from Israel. It, they didn't succeed, it, and to my best knowledge, uh, the attempts were not uh, uptaken uh, so far, but there's always this possibility, and in my understanding, we do uh, meet the criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so many useful links in the chat. We are noting all of them. I feel like uh another working group has just come into existence um okay this is the final minute uh and i want to i want to use it to thank you once again for for joining us i believe this was a day that was full of insights and inspirations and uh i had a moment when i felt tired but after this discussion i feel like uh I'm super excited <laughs> again, as in the morning, uh, because you gave so much more um, to to what we've already discussed. Uh, if if there are any additional questions to to our panelists, uh, it's it's the time to to ask, or maybe anyone wants to comment still. Maybe the panelists themselves want to say something before. We end the, this discussion. I would just like thank you for the invite, um, but specifically thank you for having uh, that I have the chance to learn so much today, and that was really fantastic. And um, I really, uh, really enjoy the project, and it was a great pleasure and honor to participate in this whole day. Thank you for that. Thank you, Christian. I want to definitely congratulate you uh, all for doing this amazing job. Uh, this is really great input. Uh, a lot of uh, it was uh, great to read. It was also well structured. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, there's still so much uh, to take on for me uh, from that. Uh, I was involved not in the network, but in the similar projects in the like heritage related projects in Wikimedia movement before. I still learn a lot and uh, I will definitely <laughs> would like to be involved in future. So thank you so much for that. And so, there's so there's so much potential there. So before it, you, you Twelve into this hard work, I hope continuation. Please really have a proper celebration tonight. I really wish I could join you, but I'm only saying this now. I will not be able to attend. But uh, please really have a moment to to celebrate what you achieved because this is really great. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Now I I should turn on uh, "Wish You Were Here" by by Pink Floyd. Um, mm -hmm as a farewell song. <laughs> um, any Anyone else? Okay, I see comments. Uh, thank, thank you, Susanna. And yes, thank you, David. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. So still so much to, to do. Uh, and yes, we are going to celebrate soon <laughs> with, our, with our guests here. Uh, I hope we will have a chance to celebrate with all of you at a certain point someday, somewhere, uh, in a nice cultural or natural heritage <laughs> site. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. Um, I think we will end here because uh, I, I feel like uh, our brains are um, exploding at, the, at this point. Uh, and as I said, the, mm, the whole recording will be available on YouTube within several days. The final papers will be published also within several days. Um, and you will see them on the project page. And we will definitely think of a landing page 
because this is exactly where we could try all the UX um, recommendations from, from one, of, one of the papers. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, it's been a fantastic day um, for me and um, all the people in the room are, are smiling. Thank you. Take care. Be careful when you photograph <laughs> and when you have pictures to comments. <laughs> Thanks for everyone. Okay, and thank you, Natalia, for bye moderating bye. and organizing this. Thank you. Thank you.